Okay, so it was the summer of 88, and I was finally taking that big road trip across the southwest I'd always dreamed of. My name's Doug, and after months of saving every penny, I was ready. Just me, my old trusty RV, and the open road. First stop, Big Bend National Park in Texas. I'd heard so much about this place, the vast desert landscape, the Rio Grande River, and those dark, starry nights. Seemed like the perfect place to kick back for a few days and get away from it all. I rolled into the park late one afternoon, found an empty spot, and set up camp. Man, that first night was something else. The kind of quiet that's so deep you can practically hear your own heartbeat. Stars like I'd never seen before, like someone had tossed diamonds right up into that velvet dark. Next morning, I'm up bright and early, eager to hit the trails little did I know. My peaceful escape was about to get a hell of a lot less peaceful. I set out on a pretty long hike, planning to loop back to my camp by sunset. Figured I'd best pack a good lunch, plenty of water, and an extra flashlight. You know, just in case. That first half went real smooth. Breathtaking scenery everywhere I looked, and thankfully, the trail was well marked. But things got weird after lunchtime, on the way back. I could have sworn I was following the right path, but the landscape didn't feel familiar. Rocks, trees, formations, nothing seemed to match what I remembered. I stopped for a minute, took a swig of water, and double-checked my map. Sure enough, I should have been on the way down into a shallower section of the canyon by now. My stomach churned a bit. Did I space out and miss a turn? Was I getting myself lost? Now I'm not one to panic. Usually, I'm pretty good at keeping my head straight, but there was something off-kilter about that whole situation. An unease that prickled the back of my neck. I decided the best move was to backtrack a little, retrace my steps until I hit something I could recognize for sure. And that's when I saw it. Not the trail, something else. Faint footprints in the dust. Human footprints. I followed them for a bit, my heart starting to quicken. They weren't fresh but enough to see that whoever made them was going in the opposite direction from the way I wanted to go. I froze. There weren't supposed to be many people on this specific trail, especially not midweek. Had another hiker gotten lost and wandered back this way? Or was it something, well, something I didn't want to think about? For whatever reason, and I still don't know quite why, I decided to follow the footprints. There was this tugging feeling in my gut, like an itch I couldn't ignore. Maybe it was stupid curiosity, maybe a morbid fascination, I don't know. But something drew me in. The tracks led me away from the trail, deeper into the canyon. The sun was sinking lower now, painting the rocks in that golden late afternoon light. With every step, that sense of isolation deepened. There was an eerie quiet, not even the usual buzz and flutter of desert critters. And then I saw something that made me stop in my tracks. A campsite. Kind of. It was a jumbled mess, really a ripped-up tarp, scattered food tins, a busted-up cooler. There were clothes strewn around, too, like someone left in a real hurry. Now my alarm bells were ringing full blast. I should have hightailed it back to the main trail, reported this weird situation to a ranger. But I didn't. Instead, I edged closer, drawn in by some awful fascination. That's how I came across it, the body. Half hidden in a clump of scrub brush, barely more than a skeleton wrapped in some bleached clothes. I don't know how long I stood there, staring in stunned horror. All I could think was... Who did this? What happened out here? And could I be next? Suddenly, I heard a snap of a twig. I spun around, 
heart pounding so loud I could barely hear anything else. Just on the edge of the clearing, I caught a glimpse of a figure, half hidden by the shadows. Tall, gaunt. Even at a distance, I could make out wild unkempt hair, a ragged beard. And he was staring right at me. I didn't wait for a better look. I ran. Blind panic drove me forward, scrambling over rocks, dodging thorny brush, gasping for air. All I could think was, if he could do that to that other person, God knows what he'd do to me. Behind me, I thought I heard footsteps, but I didn't dare look back. The landscape blurred as I stumbled onward, driven by pure terror. I'm not sure how long I ran. It felt like forever. But eventually, I burst back onto the main trail, finally somewhere familiar. I sprinted from my campsite, barely slowing down to grab my keys before tearing out of there in the RV. I put as much distance between me and Big Bend as I could, only stopping when the gas gauge hit dangerously close to empty. It took days before my heart stopped hammering like a scared rabbit every time a car pulled up alongside me. I made it to a small town and holed up in a cheap motel for a while. I barely slept, haunted by nightmares of that half-hidden body and the gaunt figure with the wild eyes. Finally, my fear turning into a kind of cold, simmering anger, I decided to call the cops. It didn't sit right with me. Whoever that person was out in the desert, they didn't deserve to be left out there like someone's forgotten trash. Problem was, I could barely remember the exact spot I found the campsite. No landmarks stuck out in my memory, just that general feeling of being way off the beaten path. The cops were sympathetic, but there wasn't much they could do without more detail. They told me what I already figured some folks wander into the desert, don't know the risks, and never come out. I knew that, but still, the image of that ragged camp haunted my thoughts. It didn't fit the usual story of a lost hiker. I decided my best bet was to head back to Big Bend, try and retrace my steps, and hope something would jog my memory. It was a long shot but I couldn't just let it go. Back in the park, the familiar scenery stirred up the whole terrifying incident all over again. I hiked those same trails, a creeping unease following me the entire time. Had he seen me make that first discovery? Was he still out there, watching me even now? I started to jump at every shadow. Every time the wind kicked up, I swore I was hearing footsteps. But there was nothing. No trace of that messed up campsite, and definitely no sign of the wild-eyed man. Then, just as I was about to give up, I saw it. A flash of color tucked against a rock outcropping, just off the beaten track. It was a faded blue tarp, the same kind I saw at the first campsite. I knew in my gut this was it. I inched closer, heart pounding, and that's when I saw the bones. More of them this time, scattered around the campsite, bleached white by the sun. And then I stumbled upon something that made me stop cold a battered metal locket, half buried in the dirt. I picked it up, my hand shaking. Inside was a faded photograph, a woman, smiling a little sadly. Her face seemed familiar, but I couldn't quite place it. I realized then, there wasn't just one victim out here. That locket was proof. That gaunt, wild-looking figure. He wasn't some hermit gone off the grid. He was a murderer. He probably lured people out here, killed them for who knows what reason, and left their bodies for the coyotes. I had to get this evidence to the police. But a strange voice in the back of my head whispered, What if you don't? What if there's a way to stop the guy yourself? It was a crazy thought, a dangerous one. But as I stared at the woman's face in the locket, my simmering anger edged into the territory of full-blown rage. I slipped the locket into my pocket. 
There was no way in hell I could go back to my old life when there was a possibility, however slim, of stopping that monster. I headed back to my RV, a plan beginning to form in my mind. One way or another, I wouldn't be some scared rabbit anymore. I was the hunter now. Look, I know this ending sounds real messed up. Probably even illegal. But something shifted in me that day. Sometimes you see the darkness in the world, the real evil, and it leaves a mark. I never considered myself a vengeful man before, but this wasn't about revenge. It was about making sure no one else ended up bones in the desert. That woman in the locket, whoever she was, she deserved justice. So did that other poor soul I stumbled across out there. Sometimes the cops, the law, it's not enough. Sometimes a regular guy has to do something, even if it lands him in hot water. I ain't proud of what I'm about to do, but I'll let you know how it turns out. Either way, I won't be able to live with myself until I try. It was summer of 87, and my dad and I decided to make our annual fishing trip a little more adventurous. Instead of our usual spot on the lake, we'd head out to the wild Ozarks in Missouri, stay in a cabin, and rough it for a few days. My name's Jake, and I was pumped for an escape from city life. We loaded up the old truck, drove to our rented cabin deep in the woods, and settled in. Seemed like a cozy place, rustic but well-kept. Just a little ways down a dirt trail, there was a small, clear river perfect for catching trout, just what we were after. First day went smooth. Dad and I woke up early, hiked down to the river, and spent a solid few hours casting our lines. Pretty decent haul of fish, too, which we cleaned and cooked up back at the cabin. Full bellies and tired muscles made for a good night's sleep. Problem is, the next morning, that peaceful feeling started to sour. While I was getting breakfast ready, I heard a noise outside, a rustle in the bushes. Figured it was a deer or something, so I went to take a look. There was nothing there. Just those thick, green woods stretching out as far as I could see. It wasn't the rustle that bothered me. It was the feeling that crept up my spine, like eyes on me. I brushed it off, told myself I was just getting paranoid. Still, for the rest of the day, I was on edge. Every twig snap, every rustling leaf, I jumped. Dad noticed, of course. Asked me what was wrong. I chalked it up to nerves, made a joke about maybe catching something too big on my line last time. He gave me a look, but didn't push it. Thing is, that night confirmed something was off. We were hanging out on the cabin's porch, enjoying the cool evening air. Dad dozed off, so I stayed up, staring into the darkness of those woods. That's when I saw it. Just on the edge of the porch light, a flash of movement, too big for a small animal, shaped more like a person ducking back into the shadows. Now, I'm not usually the kind to get spooked easily. But out there, in the middle of nowhere, with nothing but trees and the sound of the river, it got to me. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and all rational thought went flying out the window. I woke Dad up, mumbling something about thinking I saw an animal, maybe even a bear. His eyes were bleary, but there was a sharp alertness to him. He's an ex-marine, taught me everything I knew about surviving in the wild. Something in my voice must have tipped him off that it wasn't just an overactive imagination. We went inside quietly. Dad checked the rifle we kept locked up for emergencies. Then he sat me down, voice low but firm, and told me to pay attention. Son, he said, I think someone out there might be watching us. 
I swear my blood ran cold. Just the confirmation of it, that I wasn't crazy. Dad ran me through a plan. Locked down the cabin. Board up the windows, makeshift but sturdy. Gather supplies like we were preparing for a storm. And most importantly, be quiet. If whoever was out there thought we weren't on to them, maybe they'd just leave us alone. We spent the next few hours in a tense whirlwind, barricading ourselves and felt surreal, like something out of a movie. I tried to help, tried to crack a nervous joke or two, but Dad shushed me, his face hard. It was terrifying, but there was also a strange kind of focus, like a fog had lifted. Fear turned to determination. Dad said it was a fight-or-flight response kicking in, a primal instinct to survive. By nightfall, we were hunkered down. The lamps were off, and Dad was positioned by a crack in the boards over the window, rifle at the ready. I sat across the room, a hunting knife Dad gave me clutched in my sweaty hand. I tried to focus on breathing tried to listen for sounds outside over the pounding of my own heart. Hours passed. Nothing but the wind and an owl hooting somewhere in the distance. My mind raced, a thousand worst-case scenarios playing out. Who could be out there? Some kind of weirdo holed up in the woods? An escaped convict? Or was it even worse something I didn't want to name? Some creature lurking out there that was more myth than man? Just when I was about to doze off from the exhaustion, I heard it. Faint, but unmistakable footsteps crunching on the gravel outside. My heart slammed into overdrive. Were they circling the cabin? Were they going to try and force their way in? Shake! Dad whispered from the darkness, so low I barely caught it. Get down and don't move a muscle. Do you understand me? I nodded, terror making it hard to swallow. The footsteps came closer, then there was a dragging sound against the wooden porch, like something heavy being pulled along the ground. Then a thud, something left right outside our door. I risked a peek through the boards. In the faint moonlight, I could make out a burlap sack and the unmistakable, coppery smell of blood hit my nose. My stomach turned. Something was dead in that sack. I could feel it. What kind of sick freak leaves that on your doorstep? Was it a warning? Or something worse, like a twisted, gruesome gift, a promise of what was to come for us? Dad didn't move from his spot by the window. I wanted to scream at him to do something. But even in that moment of sheer terror, I knew yelling would only draw whoever, or whatever, was out there closer. He finally moved, a slow, controlled motion. He grabbed his flashlight and carefully lifted the edge of the boards over the window, aiming the beam of light down at the sack. A dead deer. That's what it was. Fresh blood matted the fur and its eyes stared empty and lifeless. I felt a wave of nausea, but under that, a flicker of relief. An animal. This could be a hunter screwing with us, some kind of sick, backwoods initiation thing. That didn't make the pit in my stomach go away completely, but it beat the hell out of what my imagination had been conjuring up. Stay low, Dad whispered. I heard the soft click of the safety on the rifle. He eased the window open, a sliver at a time. His movements were steady, methodical. Years out in the wilderness had taught him there is danger and panic. He aimed the rifle out, scanning the darkness. Nothing out there but trees and shadows swaying in the breeze. He moved towards the door, still crouched low. I was right behind him. Knife clutched like some pitiful excuse for a weapon. Dad gestured towards the bloody sack. I got the message go see what else might be in there. Holding my breath, I edged closer. There was a glint of metal in the burlap. And a piece of folded up paper tucked underneath. 
I grabbed the paper, shoved it in my jeans pocket, and retreated back inside, all the while trying not to look at the dead, staring eyes of the deer. Back in the safety of the barricaded cabin, my hands were shaking as I unfolded the paper. Moonlight slanted in just enough for me to read the crudely scrawled words. You're on my land now. A wave of icy fear washed over me. Not just a random hunter then, someone who thought they owned this piece of the woods. Someone who felt like they had the right to kill anything that crossed their path, animal or human. We were in real danger. Dad came over, took one look at my face, and his grim expression hardened further. I handed him the note. He read it, swore under his breath, and a tense silence fell over us. Suddenly, a horrible thought struck me. The fish. Those trout we caught the first day, still out on the porch in a bucket. Dad swore again. It was the scent, he muttered. It's what drew him out here. He knew there were fresh supplies. This guy wasn't just some recluse, he was a predator. It chilled me to the bone. The rest of the night was an agonizing blur of whispered plans and terrified waiting. At first light, we knew we had to try and get out of there. Dad carefully unboarded one window, rifle ready. The coast looked clear. Too quiet, probably. We packed the bare essentials into backpacks, quiet and fast. We debated taking the truck, but it was too noisy. It'd give away our escape to whoever was waiting out there in the trees. On foot was our best bet, even if it meant leaving most of our supplies behind. Before slipping out the door, I took one last look at that dead deer that cruel note. Something wouldn't let it go. There was a detail I wasn't processing, some nagging feeling. I reached back into my pocket, pulled out the note, reread it. You're on my land now. And that's when it hit me. Misspelled. The word, your, was wrong. Whoever wrote that note, they weren't well educated. And something about the handwriting, the way the letters were formed, slow and deliberate, like someone who wasn't used to it. A wave of realization crashed over me, a cold, dawning dread. Maybe this wasn't a seasoned survivalist, a twisted hunter, but someone clumsy, almost childlike. Someone who maybe had been watching us from the woods for much longer than we thought. I had to tell Dad had to make him understand that we weren't just dealing with danger. We were facing a whole other level of disturbed. But as I opened my mouth to speak, I heard it, the crack of a branch snapping from outside. We froze. My heart pounded so loud I thought surely our pursuer could hear it from wherever they were lurking. There was no time for explanations. Follow me. Dad hissed and we were out the door, darting for the thicker cover of trees on the edge of the clearing. We moved with a desperate kind of speed, the kind born from pure survival instinct. Dad was in front, eyes scanning, rifle at the ready. I was right on his heels, trying to match his pace despite the gnawing terror in my gut. The Ozarks in summer are dense. Thorny bushes tangled at our feet, and branches whipped at our faces as we pushed through the undergrowth. It felt like the wilderness itself was trying to slow us down, closing in on us, trapping us. It was maddening. I could tell Dad was aiming for the river. If we could make it there, follow it downstream, maybe we'd come across another cabin or the main road eventually. It was a slim hope, but the only one we had. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves had me ready to bolt, convinced this was the moment he would strike, emerge from the green like some forest demon. But the minutes stretched on, and there was no sound but our own ragged breathing and the pounding of blood in our ears. Just when I was starting to think maybe we'd lost him, I tripped. 
one foot snagged on a root hidden in the leaves, and I went down hard, my knees slamming onto a sharp rock. I cried out, a hiss of pain escaping through my teeth. Dad was back at my side in a flash. He crouched, scanning the tree lean. You okay, son? His voice was low, tight with worry. I think so, I muttered, trying to flex my knee. It throbbed, but I could still stand, limp a little. I swore under my breath. We didn't have time for this. Come on, he said. Just a little further and we'll rest. The next half hour was agony. Adrenaline masked the worst of the pain in my knee, but every step sent a shooting jolt up my leg. I was slowing Dad down, I knew it. Probably leaving a trail an idiot could follow. Then we finally broke through the trees and I saw it, the river, sparkling in the midday sun. Relief flooded through me, but it was quickly replaced by a different kind of dread. The banks were steep, and the current looked strong. I'm not a terrible swimmer, but with my bad leg. I didn't like our chances. Dad must have sensed my hesitation because he put a hand on my shoulder. His grip was firm but reassuring. Look, he said quietly, pointing to a spot across the river where the land sloped more gradually to the water. We can cross there and follow the bank south. There has to be a road out there eventually. The plan made sense, in theory. In practice, it looked terrifying. But after that night holed up in the cabin, the woods felt even more menacing, and something about the quiet flow of the river whispered escape. Dad nodded at me, resolute, and then he did something unexpected. He laid his rifle gently on the ground, then slung off his backpack. Without a word, he waded into the water. It came up to his knees, then his waist, the current tugging at his legs. He reached the calmer water near the middle and swam the rest of the way across, surprisingly fast for a guy his age. I watched as he emerged on the opposite side, dripping, and signaled us that it was safe. I took a shaky breath. Here goes nothing. I followed Dad into the water. The shock of the cold took my breath away, and the current was stronger than I expected. I slipped, flailing for purchase, and my bad knee buckled. Panic flared just as it had the night before. I was going to get swept away, drown out here in the middle of nowhere. Just another victim for the madman in the woods. Then, strong hands grabbed me under the shoulders. Dad had swum back out to meet me, determination etched into his face. Come on, he yelled over the rush of the water. We're almost there. His voice was a lifeline, cut through the panic. I fought against the river, kicking clumsily, propelling myself forward with a strength I didn't know I had. Finally, my hands hit gravel, and I scrambled onto the opposite bank, collapsing in a shivering heap. Dad pulled himself up beside me, breathing just as heavy. We didn't have to ask, we both knew it. We weren't going to stop until we found help. We followed the riverbank, my limp getting worse but my steps fueled by desperation. We didn't speak, just moved, a wordless pact between us. Hours passed, or maybe only minutes, it was hard to tell. And then, finally, we saw it. A break in the trees, the glint of metal. A dirt road. And beyond that, a beat-up old truck parked alongside it. Salvation. It seemed too good to be true. Surely the truck belonged to him, our pursuer. We'd stumbled directly into his trap. But a desperate gamble seemed better than waiting for the inevitable back in the woods. We inched closer, ready to run at any sign of danger. And that's when I saw it, a figure slumped inside the truck, head resting on the steering wheel. It wasn't him. It was another man, dressed in faded overalls. Asleep. 
or worse. A wave of guilt washed over me. We couldn't leave this guy just lying there, but approaching him could be risky as hell. Yet, leaving someone stranded out here, that wasn't something we could do. It just wasn't who we were. Decision made, we crept up to the truck. Dad tapped lightly on the window. The man inside jolted awake, startled. But when he saw us, his confusion melted into a weary smile. Turned out he was just an old-timer, a local who'd fallen asleep at the wheel after a long day of fishing. Our story came pouring out, a frantic jumble of words. About the cabin, the dead deer, the note, everything. The old man listened, his expression a mix of concern and a kind of grim amusement. When we finished, he let out a low whistle. Sounds like you boys ran into old Harlan he said. He's a bit off his rocker, but mostly harmless. Lives deep in the woods keeps to himself. But yeah, he smirked. He's mighty protective of what he thinks is his. The relief was so great it made me weak in the knees. Not a serial killer, not some monster out of a nightmare. Just a strange old hermit. It was almost anticlimactic. That night, we stayed with the old fisherman in his tiny house on the outskirts of town. As I lay trying to sleep, I thought back to that crude note, and the nagging feeling it had stirred in me. I still couldn't shake the sense that something was amiss. The next day, the police checked out the cabin and confirmed the fisherman's story. No trace of anyone else, just our things, and the remains of that poor deer. We eventually made it back to the city, life returned to normal, or as normal as it could get after that. But even now, years later, sometimes I'll be walking down a crowded street, and I'll feel it, that prickle of unease on the back of my neck. I'll skin the faces, searching for some sign of him, some hint that maybe I'm not as safe as I tell myself that I am. Because the wilderness can hold all kinds of secrets the human kind as much as any other. And there are some mysteries, it seems, that stay as wild and untamed as the woods themselves. Okay, so it was the summer of 89. I was finally taking that cross-country road trip I'd dreamt about for years. Just me, the RV, and the open road stretching ahead. My name's Mark, by the way. Figured I'd hit up some of the classic national parks along the way Yosemite, Yellowstone, the whole nine yards. First stop, Sequoia National Park, California. Those giant redwood trees? Man, there's something else. Humbling, makes you feel small in the best kind of way. Found a sweet spot to park the RV for a few nights, set up camp. Perfect place to chill, hike the trails, and breathe in that crisp forest air. Or so I thought. Turned out, this little slice of paradise wasn't as deserted as it seemed. That first night, just as I was drifting off, I heard it. Footsteps outside the RV. Heavy, not like an animal. Snapped awake heart pounding. Told myself I was being paranoid, probably just a hiker passing by. But that nagging sense of unease wouldn't leave. Like a feeling of being watched, of eyes on me from the darkness. Next morning, I'm up with the sun, determined to shake off the jitters. I mean, come on, it's Sequoia National Park, not some horror movie set. Hiked through these quiet trails all day, the sunlight filtering through the trees, the smell of pine needles all around. Almost forgot about the previous night, almost. By the time I got back to camp, though, the sense of dread was heavier than ever. And there was something new. A burlap sack left on the picnic table next to the RV. It wasn't there before. My skin prickled with fear. 
Inside I could see a shape. My stomach did a sickening flip. Dead animal. It had to be. Why else leave it there? I didn't touch the sack. Just stared at it, my mind racing. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Or something worse? That night I barely slept. Every noise, every rustle of leaves in the wind, I jumped. Tossed and turned, shining my flashlight outside the windows as if expecting to catch a glimpse of something, someone, lurking out there. Morning comes, and it's decision time. I could ditch this campsite, try and find another place where I didn't feel constantly on edge. But there was another part of me, the stubborn part, maybe the foolish part, that was itching for answers. That burlap sack gnawed at my thoughts. I had to see what was inside. So, armed with a pocket knife I kept in the RV and a whole lot of apprehension, I edged closer to the table. The smell of rot grew stronger with every step. Taking a deep, shaky breath, I grabbed the edge of the burlap and pulled. A leg. A human leg. Not an animal. I stumbled back, gasping. Vomit rose in my throat, but I somehow kept it down. It could be a prank, a twisted, gruesome prank. I had to tell myself that. Had to cling to some sliver of sanity, even as the image of that severed leg burned itself into my brain. My first instinct was to run for the RV, to drive until I left this nightmare place far behind. But then came a horrifying thought. What if the person this leg belonged to? What if they weren't dead yet? The realization hit me like a cold splash of water. This wasn't about scaring me off. It was about drawing me in, luring me deeper into the woods. And if someone was wounded out there, maybe even still alive, I couldn't leave them. Scrambling for the first aid kit I kept in the RV, I shoved as many supplies as I could into my backpack. Figured between that and my pocket knife, I was as prepared as I could be for whatever came next. Then, following a sickening hunch, I headed in the direction the leg and the burlap had been pointing. There had to be more somewhere in the woods, more pieces, and maybe, just maybe, a chance to find the person they came from. The deeper I ventured into the forest, the more the knot of dread in my stomach tightened. It felt like a maze out there, those towering trees shutting out the sky, making it impossible to guess which way I'd come from. The once beautiful landscape now seemed menacing, a trap sprung and waiting. I was about to lose my nerve when I saw it. A flash of red flannel. It was snagged high on a branch. That had to be a marker, a clue someone had left. I reached up, and as I pulled it free, something else fell to the ground, landing with a soft thud. It was a man's boot. My head swam with fear. More questions than answers, and none of them good. Then, just when I thought it couldn't get more messed up, I heard a voice. Low strain coming from somewhere nearby. Help me, please. Someone was alive out here. My heart gave a desperate leap. Every instinct told me to run in the other direction, but with my legs frozen in a terrible mix of terror and adrenaline, I inched forward and followed the sound. He was half hidden behind a tangle of bushes, too weak to move, covered in dirt and blood, and he was missing his other leg. I gotta get you out of here. I blurted out. He just looked at me, his eyes a mix of fear and desperate hope. He was bleeding badly. I could see the panic rising in him. I tried to lift him, but he was too heavy. Think you can make it to the RV? I asked, already dreading the answer. No, he whispered, and I could see the life draining out of him. It was up to me. I found a thick branch, tore strips from my shirt, makeshift tourniquets. 
worked fast, clumsy with adrenaline and the sheer horror of it all, voice shaking as I tried to talk him through it, even though I knew it was probably pointless. He just stared at me, his breath coming in ragged gasps. Who did this to you? I asked, the words spilling out of me. Had to know if whoever was behind this was still out there. He tried to answer. His lips barely moved. I leaned in closer, and the words hit me like a cold, sickening wave. Rancher, he choked out. I blinked. That made no sense. A rancher out here? What the hell was he talking about? Before I could ask, his head slumped forward, and I knew he was gone. There I was, in the middle of the freaking wilderness, with a dead, butchered man near me, his severed limbs strewn around like some nightmare scene. The thought of being next sent a wave of pure terror through me. I had to get help, report this to the authorities. It was the right thing, the only thing to do. But leaving him behind, the guy who just moments ago begged for help, it felt wrong. And the nagging thought that someone was still out there, watching, it made my skin crawl. I decided to make a crude stretcher out of branches. Moving the body would be risky, but I couldn't let him lie there. Figured if I could at least get him back to the clearing near my RV, I'd have a better chance of finding my way out and getting help. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Lugging a dead man through dense forests, the smell of his blood and the weight of his body making me want to throw up. The whole time I was ready to bolt at every crack of a twig or rustling of leaves. My heart hammered against my ribs, and the thought pounded in my head, I'm next. I'm next. Reaching the clearing was almost as horrifying as finding him. There was my RV. And beside it, crudely scrawled in what looked like blood, was a message. Your turn now. Bow rose in my throat. It was a promise, a threat. No time for panic. Shoved the stretcher into the RV, trying not to look at the body as I did. Jumped into the driver's seat, threw it in gear, and floored it. Those giant redwood trees flashed past in a blur as I tore down the bumpy dirt road, not caring where I was headed as long as it was away from that place. Finally, hours later maybe, I burst out onto a paved highway. Didn't stop until I reached the first sign of civilization, a gas station with a flickering neon sign and a lone, haggard-looking attendant at the counter. The police, a flurry of blue lights and urgent questions. My story, spilling out in a confused jumble. The park rangers swarming the isolated campsite. The search team scouring the woods for days. Me, back in the city, trying to forget. They never found a trace of anyone else. No rancher, no mysterious person living in the woods, certainly no explanation for the murdered man, his mutilated body, or the message meant for me. Officials chalked it up to a wild animal attack gone wrong, but I knew, deep down, they didn't believe me. It's been years now. Most days, I can push it to the back of my mind. I tell myself it was a freak occurrence, a gruesome accident twisted into a nightmare by paranoia and shock. But sometimes, late at night, when the shadows dance on the walls, I see the severed leg in the burlap sack. I feel again the cold grip of terror deep in the woods. And I remember that blood-scrawled message. The wilderness isn't always beautiful. Sometimes, the darkest secrets lie out there beneath the trees, and some mysteries are never meant to be solved. Sometimes the worst monsters aren't fanged creatures or mythical beasts. Sometimes they walk on two legs. And sometimes you can almost imagine the eyes on your back, even in a crowded city.
It's 1988. Me and my wife, Susan, are taking a little road trip through Oregon. We love seeing the woods, especially this time of year when things start to change color. Nothing better, and my old RV can still handle the road just fine. Lately, work's been rough, and Susan's got family troubles. We thought the best idea was to get the hell away just for a week. We loaded up the RV and decided to wing it, no firm schedule. And so far I ain't regretting one damn minute. We pull into this state park called Silver Falls. It's nice. Susan sets up the picnic basket while I park the RV near the back of the lot. Figure we'll hole up, do some walking, just chill. She lays out some sandwiches under a big maple, and we eat, listening to the birds do their thing. This was the right call, Jake. Seriously. My head feels lighter, Susan tells me. I grin at her. She needed this, even more than me. That's why I pushed for it. After lunch, we pack a day bag, get on some decent boots, and hit some trails. And wow, I mean wow. Every bend is a painting, and this air, it's like... I can't even describe it, clean, crisp. By the time dusk hits, we're kinda whipped. Susan falls asleep on the drive back, which is fine with me. I ain't in no rush. There's a spot just up the road where we can hook up the RV for the night and maybe get some decent sleep before heading out in the morning. The place is pretty empty, just two other RVs. It's peaceful, though. That is, until after dark. Then I start hearing stuff. It ain't any animal I know of like footsteps, heavy and quick, snapping twigs, circling around the RV. Susan, babe, wake up, I whisper. She stirs, then sits up with a confused frown. What's up? I was having the weirdest dream, she mumbles. I think something's out there. Stay low. I'm gonna try and look out. I grab the flashlight, heavy and old school. I peek out the window and sweep it around. For a beat, nothing. Then the beam flickers across something, a shape in the shadows. It moves quick and I can't get a full look, but it's big, taller than any man I've seen. And it's hunched, almost deformed. I swallow hard, hard jackhammering. Susan's eyes are wide with fear. The footsteps get closer. There's a scraping against the RV that sets my teeth on edge. We gotta get out of here. I whisper. The engine sputters on the first key turn. I slam the palm of my hand on the dash. Come on, you piece of... Susan staring out the window, her face white. Jake, is that a hand? Sure enough, in the weak dash light, there's a hand pressed up against the window, abnormally long fingers sliding down the glass. It leaves a smear and I try to gag back the bow rising in my throat. The engine roars alive, and I tear out of that spot. The noises chase us, fainter as we gain distance. I don't see any headlights in the rear view. Seems we lost, whatever the hell that was. We keep driving into the night. I don't even know where we're going at this point. Susan's shaking next to me, and I can't blame her. Finally, we pull into some rest stop in the middle of nowhere. We'll sleep here, I say, even though sleep's the furthest thing from my mind. She just nods, and I pull her close for comfort. We're locked in here until sunrise, watching the shadows flicker and trying to convince ourselves whatever was out there is gone. I glance once at the smeared window, that inhuman handprint. Come morning... The first thing we're doing is calling the police and then burning the hell out of this RV. The sun can't come soon enough. Every second we wait is pure torture. We're trapped, and there's a sick feeling settling in my gut that whatever it was at Silver Falls, it ain't done with us. 
That handprint on the window. It looked thick, strong, like it could easily smash through and... A scratching sound breaks the silence. A faint thud against the side of the vehicle. Oh God! Susan whimpers. I can feel her body trembling against mine. The RV rocks slightly, and I know it's on the outside. It circles, a predator testing its prey. The scratching circles the top, the flimsy roof. Susan grabs my arm like a lifeline, her fingernails digging into my skin. The air is heavy with the stink of something foul. It circles us, and with each pass, the scratches get louder, bolder. It knows we're trapped. This is a game to it. A sickening clang rips through the night as something hits the metal side panel, making the RV jerk violently. Susan screams, her nails leaving angry red marks on my arm. I clench my fists, but there's nothing to punch, no way to fight back. Damn it, what does it want? I growl, more to myself than to Susan. There's no answer, just that scratching, nails on steel, like it's desperate to get in. We sit there in the dark, frozen with fear, while the night becomes a terrifying symphony of scratches, thumps, and whatever unholy noises that thing can make. The rest stop is dead silent now, no traffic, no distant chatter, nothing to distract from the awful sounds outside. I picture that hand clawing at the RV, its monstrous shape hunched and moving with a speed that doesn't seem humanly possible. Is it even a man at all? My chest burns like it might burst open, each ragged breath more panic than the last. Susan's huddled against me, sobbing quietly. I want to tell her it'll be okay, but it's a damn lie, and we both know it. It feels like hours, but maybe it's only minutes. Time has no meaning when you're waiting for death to tear its way in. There's a pause, and I think for a desperate second that it's gone. Then a massive weight slams into the roof, the metal groaning in protest. Susan lets out a choke scream. It's on top of us. It's going to rip through the tin roof like it's nothing. A sickening realization hits me as another thought claws its way out of the fog of terror. This thing is playing with us. We gotta move, I say, voice raspy with strain. Susan looks at me, her face a mask of desperation. Where? We can't go out there. We can't stay here either. The roof dents even more under the unseen weight. I grab the flashlight, heavy and metallic in my hand a pathetically useless weapon. Go where the light shines. I grunt, unlocking the door. I swing it open, blinding light flooding out into the night. And there, illuminated in the harsh glare, is the source of the horror. It's a man, all right, but he looks barely human. He's huge, swollen with muscle, face gaunt and twisted in a feral snarl. Eyes like cold marbles in the night, reflecting the flashlight. Clothes torn, skin covered in dirt, and... Is that blood? For a moment he freezes, dazzled. That's our chance. On instinct, I shove Susan out and leap after her, slamming the door closed. We stumble to our feet, and I take off running. Susan tries to keep up, but she stumbles on the uneven ground. With a curse, I scoop her up, adrenaline surging through me. We run blindly, the rest stop lights barely visible in the distance. Behind us, the RV creaks and shudders as he tries to break in. A howl splits the night. We glance back to see him perched on the roof, a monstrous silhouette outlined against the moonlit sky. We crash onto the road, barely missing an oncoming truck. The blaring horn is a blessing, masking the inhuman howl echoing from the trees. I half-drag, half-carry Susan. She's dead weight in my arms, the panic finally overwhelming her. The rest stop comes into focus, and people spill out, startled by the noise. 
I yell, voice ragged. He's out there. At first, it's confusion. Then disbelief changes to horror as they hear the furious roaring from behind us. A man with a shotgun steps forward. In that moment, he's an angel, a savior. He fires once, twice. The sounds blast through the night, followed by a chilling silence. We all hold our breaths, straining to hear over the pounding of our hearts. Then, the roar erupts again, closer. The man fires again and again, the blasts deafening. Then, silence again. We stand there, frozen, not daring to think the nightmare is over. A sob breaks the air. I look down and see Susan shuddering against me, eyes wide and filled with fresh tears. The sound of sirens in the distance is the sweetest music I've ever heard. The aftermath is a blur. Explanations are impossible. Police reports are a nightmare. Witnesses are shaken but firm. It's ruled a case of a drug-crazed, psychotic individual on the loose. Our description makes it into the news, a chilling cautionary tale, but they never catch him. The RV is a mangled wreck, that handprint forever seared into my mind. Susan and I try to get on with our lives, but it's changed us. Every shadow, every sound at night, we jump. Nightmares steal our sleep, leaving us with a lingering sense of unease. We both know deep down that it's not over. Whatever was out there that night, a monster wearing a man's skin, it might come back for us someday. I was out camping in the fall of 1987, somewhere in those gorgeous red rock formations of Arizona what they call the Sedona area, I think. My name's Mike, by the way. Had this sweet RV, nothing too fancy, but enough to hit the road and leave my troubles behind for a week or two. Loved that thing. Problem was, this trip fell off from the get-go. I couldn't shake this weird feeling, like I wasn't alone. I'm usually pretty blasé about stuff like that. Live out in the sticks, you'd get used to the occasional rustle, some critter messing around. But this, this was different. First, there were the prints. I swear I didn't see them when I parked. Big prints, definitely a man's shoe, too big to be some hiker. Maybe size 13, 14. And they were everywhere, around my RV, circling the fire pit like something, or someone, had been watching me. Got my heart going, I'll admit. Told myself maybe a ranger or someone had passed through. Tried to shrug it off. Then came the noises. At first, it was nothing much. Just a snap of a twig here, a rustle there. Then, one night, I heard what sounded like footsteps outside, heavy ones, slow but deliberate. Got my flashlight, peered out the window. Nothing. Still, every time I turned around, there it was again, like something was tailing me. This wasn't no damn squirrel. By the third day, I was pretty much spooked. Figured I'd cut the trip short. I was packing up when I saw it, a flash of movement just beyond the tree lean. I froze. There was a guy, I swear, standing there. Pretty tall, broad-shouldered, hard to make out the details, but the way he just stood there, menacing. Here's where things get fuzzy. I remember reaching for my rifle, yelling for him to stay back. And then a gunshot. Not mine. I felt this searing pain in my shoulder, looked down, blood. It gets muddled after that. I must have blacked out for a second or two. When I came to, he was gone. No sign of him. Pain was blinding, though, so I scrambled back into the RV, patched myself up best I could. Then I gunned the engine. I wasn't sticking around to find out who shot me. That's when the worst of it started. 
He must have gotten inside while I was out. I saw movement in the rearview mirror, that same hulking figure, crouched in the back seat. I slammed the brakes, spun around. Nothing. I ripped the RV apart, pulled everything out. He was gone. But the feeling, that feeling never left. There was a presence. Every time I glanced in the mirror, I swore I saw him, lurking in the shadows. I'm not a superstitious guy, but I couldn't shake it. This was more than some creep in the woods. This was something else. I put the pedal to the metal and didn't stop for hours, heart pounding in my chest the whole way. I stopped in a little town, finally got the wound checked out at a clinic. The doctor asked about the gunshot. I lied. Said it was a hunting accident, too embarrassed to admit what really happened. He patched me up, sent me on my way. I don't know if that guy is still following me. Part of me is afraid to look in my rearview mirror, case I see that silhouette, those empty eyes staring back at me. He seemed to vanish into thin air, and that's the worst part, not knowing where he went, or if he'll show up again. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I hit my head when I panicked after the gunshot. I don't know anymore. All I know is, I haven't been back in that RV since. It's still parked out back, rusting away. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear footsteps outside my window. The fall of 1988 found me hitting the back roads of Tennessee. Call me Carter. I've always loved that old-school RV life, something about the freedom of the open road. Problem was, this trip felt off. Couldn't put my finger on it, just something in the back of my mind. Like I wasn't exactly alone out there. First night out, stopped in the Cherokee National Forest. It's massive, a whole lot of nothing but trees and hills. Anyway, around 3 a.m., something woke me up. Can't say what, but my skin prickled, like those nights you swear something's breathing down your neck. I grabbed my flashlight, peered out the window. Nothing. Still, that feeling gnawed at me. By morning, the dread was heavier. Figured it was nerves so I decided to move on. Took a hike to clear my head, maybe four or five miles in. When I got back to camp, that's when things got truly weird. There, dug into the mud around my RV, were a set of tracks. Big ones, boots, probably men's size twelve or so. What spooked me wasn't just the tracks, it was how fresh they looked. I hadn't been gone that long. Seen someone, or something, had been circling my camper while I was out. I got my bearings, tried to figure out where the tracks headed off to. No luck. The forest thick there, whoever made them disappeared like a ghost. My point three eight started feeling real light in my hand, I tell you. Nervy as hell, I spent hours checking around my RV expecting to see eyes glinting in the trees. That night, I didn't get a wink of sleep. Every snap, every rustle, sure it was footsteps. Started hearing whispers too, just out of reach, like someone murmuring right on the other side of the RV's thin wall. Couldn't make out the words, but the tone was pure malice. Tried to tell myself these were just tricks of the mind, but deep down, I knew better. Next morning, I couldn't take it anymore. Had to get out of there. While prepping to leave, I found something carved into the back of the RV, deep into the metal, watching. No way in hell I was sticking around to find out what the hell that was about. I threw the RV into drive, heart in my throat. That was just the start. For days, I swore I saw glimpses of someone just out of sight. A glimpse of a face in my rearview mirror, the flicker of a shadow behind a tree I passed. 
My stomach was in permanent knots. Then came the real nightmare. I stopped in one of those dinky little gas stations off the highway. Figured a public place was the safest. Inside, I was browsing the aisles, trying to find something, anything, to calm my nerves. I looked up and almost jumped out of my skin. A guy was staring at me through the grimy window. Tall, built like a brick house. Face hidden under a ball cap but I felt his stare straight in my bones. Then, he gave me this sickening smile, all teeth, no warmth. Swear to God, he mouthed the words, I found you. A chill went straight down my spine. I darted out of there, barely remembering to pay. Slammed the RV door, and peeled out of that gas station like a bat out of hell. For the next two days, I didn't stop. Barely slept, barely ate. Figured I was headed for a breakdown if I didn't get some help. Finally reached a decent-sized town. Name was Jasper. Pulled right into the local sheriff's station, figuring the police could sort this mess out. Told them everything. The tracks, the whispers, the guy at the gas station. Here's where things get worse. When I described the man, the deputy, young guy, Name tagged Red Miller, his face went pale. Seemed he recognized the description. Then, real low, he tells me they've had missing persons reports. Hikers, campers, just vanishing in the woods. Never been solved. Miller couldn't tell me anything else, said it was an ongoing investigation. But the look he gave me, it said everything I needed to know. Now, I don't know what's going on out there. Is there one creep, or a whole group of them? Are they connected to the missing folks? Maybe some kind of cult? Whatever it is, I'm never stepping foot in those woods again. Sometimes, when I'm on the road, late at night, I glance in the mirror and my blood runs cold. Because for just a split second, I think I see him out there that same hungry smile lurking in the shadows. It was sometime in the late 1980s when we did our annual RV trip. My best friend since kindergarten, Rhett, and my wife, Beth, came along like always. We always take road trips but an RV trip lets us get out into nature more fully. Since Beth planned this trip, she chose the spot. A place she had been reading about, the Ozarks in Missouri. Sounded cool to me. Off we went. Once we get there, Beth picks this spot in the woods, along a river. It's nice, real private. I park, pull out the chairs. Red grabs the fishing gear and heads towards the river. We spend a couple of hours relaxing, having a couple of cold ones. I get up and take a walk, Beth starts on dinner prep. The sun starts setting, and it's about that time of night I love. The air is kind of cool but not cold, there's a light scent of pine needles that's quiet. I'm just standing there breathing it all in, loving life when I see the fireflies begin to twinkle out amongst the trees. Something crunches in the woods. Could be a deer, or some other big animal. I look over but see nothing. Shrug it off and walk back towards the campsite, call out to Rhett. No answer. Probably didn't hear me over the river. Get back to the RV. Beth's got a killer steak going. Dinner's almost ready. Where's Rhett? she asks. Took off fishing. No worries, he'll be back soon. Sit down, and we dig into the food. Still no sign of him, but we figure he might be wandering back in the dark. The crickets kick in, the night is clear, so the starlight illuminates the trees. We can sort of see a little ways into the woods. We're polishing off the last of the beers when we hear a rustling. I figure it's finally Rhett. Took you long enough. 
I call out with a little grin on my face. No reply. The sound gets closer. Hey, rat, cut it out. You trying to scare Beth? I get a little more irritated since he's still not answering. Then I see it. A silhouette stepping out from the shadows, maybe twenty feet from our table. It's a guy. He's big. Real big. Tall with broad shoulders. I freeze, my heart hammers in my chest. He's dirty, clothes ripped. No shoes, looks like he's been living out in the woods for a while. Who the hell are you? I finally get out, my voice raspy. The guy stands there, doesn't reply. He's staring at us now, or should I say, staring at Beth. It makes me want to punch his lights out. Beth senses something is seriously wrong, steps back behind me with wide eyes. I asked you a question, buddy. I try to sound more confident than I feel. Nothing. He takes a step towards us. Look, whatever you want, I got money. Take it and go. Another step. Closer. Beth, get in the RV. I yell, pushing her back towards it. She dashes inside, and instinctively I reach for the hunting rifle cupped under the kitchen table. I fire a warning shot into the air, loud as hell in the sudden silence. The guy flinches but doesn't retreat. Get the hell out of here! I yell again. He's close now, maybe ten feet away. I can see him clearly in the dim starlight. There's something deeply off about his face, his eyes almost vacant. My stomach churns and a chill runs up my spine. This isn't just some crazy guy lost in the woods. Beth fumbles with the RV keys, hands shaking. Finally, she wrenches the door open and scrambles inside, slamming it behind her. The second she does, the guy makes a move. He charges right at me, eyes wild. I take aim and fire, hitting him square in the chest. His body jolts, but he keeps coming. No! I hear Beth scream from inside the RV. I fire again. Another hit. He staggers but doesn't go down. I can smell something acrid now, like burned meat mixed with a coppery tang. My hands tremble, but I take one last shot, this time at his head. He jerks backwards and finally collapses to the ground, a dark pool forming beneath him. The gun clatters out of my hand. My knees give out, and I'm left staring at the unmoving body in a mixture of fear and disbelief. Beth bursts out of the RV door, running to me. Oh my God, Jay, are you okay? What? What was that? I managed to stammer out a response, voice barely a whisper. Don't know. Some something wasn't right with him. Beth grabs my phone, hands shaking too hard to dial. Cops, we need to call the cops. She starts describing what happened where we are, but I can barely focus. As I'm staring off at the body, something twitches. His arm. I lurch back, a shout catching in my throat. Beth gasps, the phone falls from her hand. The body jerks, then the man slowly rises to his feet. Blood seeps through his shirt, but those eyes. They're fixed on us, a horrifying mix of dead and intent. I reach for the rifle on the ground, but he lunges again, impossibly fast. He's on me in a flash. I manage to dodge his outstretched hands, scrambling towards the trees. Beth lets out a desperate scream. Beth, run! I yell, fear propelling me forward. I hear his clumsy, heavy footsteps behind me, branches snapping as he gives chase. I stumble falling hard against the tree trunk. I look over my shoulder. He's gaining on me. I scramble to my feet, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm in my chest, the image of that dead-yet-moving man branded into my brain. 
Blindly, I run deeper into the woods, the terrain rough and uneven in the darkness. I can hear his grunting breaths close behind me and the echo of branches cracking under his heavy boots. My lungs burn. I trip and fall, scraping my hands on loose rocks and pine needles. I try to push myself up but hear a sharp tearing sound. My shirt's caught on something. Panic washes over me as I struggle, hearing him get closer, those ragged breaths like a predator hot on the trail of prey. With a surge of desperation, I rip my shirt off, leaving it snagged on a branch and scrambling back to my feet. I don't dare look back. Just run. Branches tear at my face, my bare legs. I don't know where I'm going, only that I need to put some distance between us. And I need a weapon. My eyes skin frantically for anything. A thick stick. I grab it, clutching it like a lifeline. The ground starts to slope downhill. I stumble, sliding and slipping. And then, I lose my footing and tumble. I'm falling fast. I crash down at the bottom, landing hard on a bed of rocks and leaves. Pain explodes in my side. I try to gasp for air, but the impact has knocked it clean out of me. I hear him grunting above, he's close. Closer. My eyes sting with a mix of fear and tears. This is it. There's nowhere to run. Nowhere to hide. He starts climbing down. His monstrous figure looming over me. I clutch the stick and swing blindly. It connects, a glancing blow against his arm. He roars, the sound echoing through the ravine. I swing again, again, fueled by terror. Every blow seems to just make him angrier. He lunges for my throat, and I instinctively raise the stick to shield myself. The momentum sends me sprawling back. He stumbles over the edge, but instead of tumbling down as I expect, something snags him. Branches? Or did he grab something? For a suspended moment, he dangles there, the stick jutting into one eye socket dangling just above the leaf-strewn ground. I lie there, breathless, staring up in shock. Then the handhold breaks. He plummets with a bone-jarring thud. Silence. I don't move for what feels like hours, my eyes fixated on the unmoving body below. Finally, shakily, I stand and creep towards him. His limbs sprawl at unnatural angles. One eye gapes open sightlessly, the stick still embedded in it. He's definitely dead this time. Then I hear it. Sirens in the distance. It must be the cops Beth called. My whole body sags with relief. I'm saved. I'll survive this. But questions claw at the back of my throat. Who was he? Why did my shots not kill him? Something isn't right here, something deeply, terrifyingly off. The police arrive, flashing lights cutting through the trees. I give my statement, my voice shaking and rough. They collect the bodies, mine included for injuries and evidence. In the days and weeks after, I go through the motions. Police interviews, a therapist my worried wife insists upon, even a call from some reporter trying to get a scoop on the Ozark mystery man. I can never quite shake the sense of unreality, like my life is now a horror film. The authorities never find anything, no records or missing persons that match him. It's like he, like he never existed. They put it down to some guy off his meds, a random crazy out in the wilderness. Maybe they're right but I saw what I saw. And sometimes, in the stillness of night, I wake up in a cold sweat, the sound of those heavy, impossible footsteps ringing in my ears.
Back in the late 1980s, my buddy Tanner decided we needed a guys-only trip. A little break from wives, kids, the same old routine you know how it goes. I'm Jay, by the way, and when Tanner suggests an RV adventure, I'm always in. We decide on the Pacific Northwest, somewhere we haven't been before. Some place with tall trees and plenty of fishing spots, that's the key. We end up somewhere deep in the Olympic National Forest in Washington. It's the kind of place where, yeah, okay, there might be a Bigfoot lurking, but you laugh about it because realistically that's just silly, right? The first day is pure heaven. We find this idyllic little spot practically on the banks of a river, surrounded by giant pines and ferns like something out of Jurassic Park. It gets dark, and Tanner starts messing around with lighting a campfire like some kind of caveman. I'm telling him to just fire up the propane grill, but he always has to do things the long and complicated way. Then, just when I think those burgers are never gonna be on a bun, we hear a noise. At first, it sounds like a deer or something big foraging near the trees. Whatever it is, it's too close for comfort. Easy now, probably just some elk. I whisper, mainly to myself because Tanner looks about ready to bolt back to the RV. The rustling gets louder, closer. Tanner fumbles with his pocket knife like that's gonna do anything. Then there's a crack like a branch snapping under something heavy. Silence falls over us, broken only by the low hum of crickets. I can feel my heart trying to punch its way through my ribs. Suddenly, a figure steps out of the shadows. A man, tall and broad-shouldered, with clothes that seem a couple of sizes too small. He's got ragged, unkempt hair hanging over a dark, scruffy beard. Evening, fellas, he says in a rough voice. It's hard to make out his features in the dim light, but something about him sets my teeth on edge. There's a glint in his eyes, a look of hunger. Animal-like, but I dismiss it. What, what do you want? I stammer out, sounding a lot less confident than I hoped. He doesn't answer, just stands there, sizing us up. He shifts slightly from foot to foot, hands clenching and unclenching at his sides. You lost or something? Tanner tries to keep his voice casual. He's better at this brave act than I am. Still that silence, like the man's calculating. I inch back towards the RV, but then Tanner pulls a classic idiot move. Got any food you want to share? He chuckles nervously like he's offering a beer to an old buddy. The man lunges. Faster than either of us expected. He knocks Tanner flat to the ground, snarling something incoherent. I grab a burning stick from the fire pit, shoving it directly into the guy's face. He howls and stumbles back, clutching at his scorched skin. That's my cue. Bolt. Don't look back. Don't stop running. I tear into the forest, branches slicing my face and arms, my lungs screaming for air. I can hear him behind me, his heavy tread and ragged breathing closing the distance. The trees blur together, and the ground beneath my feet turns treacherous. Roots, holes, mossy boulders hidden by the darkness, any one of them could send me sprawling. I stumble and crash to the earth pain flaring in my knee. But I don't have time to think about it. I'm already scrambling up, forcing myself back into a frantic sprint. Up ahead, I see an incline. It leads to a rocky outcropping, which gives me a sliver of hope. Maybe if I can clamber up there, I can gain some distance, even find a place to hide. My lungs burn, my legs feel like jelly but I make it up to the rocks. I turn and look back and see him emerge from the tree lean, silhouetted against the faint moonlight. He's limping, one side of his face blackened, but he's still coming. I scramble blindly across the rocks, 
looking for any crack or crevice to squeeze myself into. He'll all muscle me. I at least need a chance to disappear. Then I see it, a narrow fissure in the rock, just about wide enough. I take a running leap and fling myself towards the opening. I snag my arm on a jagged edge, tearing a bloody gash. I hear him grunting in frustration, starting to clamber over the boulders. I wedge myself in deeper, wriggling like a worm into the narrow space. Rocks scrape against my back, but I barely feel it. Pure adrenaline kicks in. I push until my fingers are bloody, inch by inch until I'm completely wedged inside. I can barely breathe, but I can hear him scrabbling and searching outside. There's a thud as he throws something against the rock face, and I feel the vibration through my entire body. I stay there, crammed against cold rock gasping shallow breaths for what feels like an eternity. After a while, the noises outside fade. First just his grunts of frustration, then the cracking of branches under his footsteps, and finally silence. My body aches, my skin's clammy with cold sweat, but I don't dare move. Time blurs together, every second crawls by an agonizing slow motion. Maybe he's given up. Or maybe he's gone for help, to get others of his kind, whatever the hell he is. That thought sends a fresh wave of panic through me. I have to get out. I inch back towards the narrow crevice entrance, my body protesting with every movement. It feels like the rocks themselves are trying to hold me in. Outside, the first hints of pre-dawn light turn the sky a pale gray. Gotta move now. I risk a glance out. Nothing. I manage to wedge myself out, scrambling down from the rocks. I limp, trying to force my stiff muscles into submission, my arm throbbing where it got gashed. Gotta get to the RV, gotta get a weapon, get out of these damn woods. Every sound in the hushed forest sends my heart pounding against my ribs. A twig snaps, and I freeze but it's just a squirrel or something. I have to keep my head. Then a voice, raspy and low. Thought you could hide from me, boy. I spin around and there he is. The man. He leans against a tree, looking only slightly disheveled, a cruel grin plastered on that dirty face. He can't be for real. I thought I took care of you back there. I say trying to keep my voice steady. It comes out as a shaky whisper. He chuckles, a dark, grating sound. That little campfire trick? That all you got? You gotta try harder than that. I glance around desperately. No way I can outrun him again, not with this leg. My eyes land on a thick branch on the ground. I stumble forward, snatch it up, clutching it like some prehistoric weapon. He starts towards me, a lazy sway in his walk, like a predator playing with its prey. I swing the branch, mostly a blind act of defiance. It connects with his side with a dull thump, and he recoils slightly. Feisty little thing, aren't you? He's not even mad, almost amused. The branch snaps in my hands, the force of the impact sending a jolt of pain through my shoulder. Useless. I toss the broken pieces aside and stand there, panting, waiting for the inevitable. Why are you doing this? My voice comes out cracked and pathetic. He tilts his head, studying me with those unsettling dark eyes. You got something I want he says, then lunges forward in that terrifying, impossible burst of speed. I instinctively jump back, but he still grabs hold of my shirt, ripping it open. His hand clamps around something on my neck, the chain with my dad's wedding ring. He tugs, and it snaps. I clutch at it, but it's too late. He holds it up like a trophy, peering at it. This is it. He mutters, a glint in his eyes, 
and then he slips it into his ragged jeans pocket. He lets go of me. I stumble back, but he doesn't make a move to follow. Now get out of my woods, he growls. And I do. I run, limping, scrambling, tears blurring my vision. I don't stop until I burst out of the forest and see the RV gleaming in the dawn light. Inside, I frantically search the cabinets until I find the first aid kit. I bandage up my cuts as best I can, but my hands won't stop shaking. I look around for Tanner, but he's gone. Absolutely gone. Somehow, I get the RV started, my hands fumbling on the wheel. I drive, not even sure where I'm going. Just away. Finally, I stop on the side of the highway and just collapse into the driver's seat. In the days and weeks that follow, I become a ghost of myself. Police reports, interviews, a missing person's case for Tanner. The cops are baffled, I'm baffled. It sounds crazy, even in my own head. But I saw what I saw, the way that man moved, those vacant eyes, the way he shrugged off the fire. None of that makes sense. They find no trace of Tanner, no sign of the guy. It's like they both blinked out of existence. Sometimes I think maybe I did, too. Maybe this whole thing never happened, some kind of breakdown out there in the middle of nowhere. But then I touch the bandage on my arm, and I see the ringless chain around my neck, and I know it was real. Something out there in those woods is real. And it's something I'll never understand. I was camping out in the redwoods in 88. You know, just me and my RV, trying to unwind a bit before starting up college that fall. Always figured it was the best place to get your head clear, those towering trees that crisp air, the sound of the creek out back lulling you to sleep. It should have been perfect if it wasn't for the nagging feeling I couldn't shake from day one. First, I found a weird note tucked under my windshield wiper. Scrawled in messy letters it read, You shouldn't be here. Nothing threatening, just unsettling. Figured it was some cranky ranger or a local who didn't like RVs on their turf. I tossed it aside. It was enough to make me extra vigilant, extra aware though. The Redwood National Forest is a maze. Even on marked trails you can feel out of your depth, like the forest is closing in on you. I figured I could handle it. I was always the outdoors type. But there were moments when I could swear something was behind me. A flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye the crunch of footsteps when I turned around. Just enough to set my teeth on edge. One night, that creepy feeling doubled. I'd made a campfire, settled into my fold-out chair, trying to enjoy the solitude. Then, just beyond the glow of the fire, I saw a pair of eyes staring back at me. And not like dear eyes. These were intelligent, purposeful. Then, clear as day, a whisper carried on the breeze. A voice, rough and low. Leave here. I jumped to my feet. My rational brain was screaming. Probably some teenagers playing pranks. Trying to spook the guy alone in the woods. That's when I saw him, standing just outside the fire's reach. A regular guy, maybe a bit older than me, with a scruffy beard worn-out work clothes. But there was this glint in his eyes, something unsettling. What's the problem, man? I asked, trying to sound tougher than I felt. The guy didn't answer. He didn't even blink. His face was like stone. I started edging towards the RV, figuring I could lock myself in until sunrise, wait him out. Then he moved. Not fast, not aggressively, just a steady, purposeful walk straight into the shadows. 
I saw a flash of something in his hand, then he was swallowed by the darkness. My heart was pounding triple time in my chest. Sleep was out of the question after that. I spent the rest of the night inside, listening intently for any sound out of the ordinary. Nothing came. By morning, the sun was filtering through the leaves. The whole scary scene felt far away. I figured it was time to pack up my gear and get out of there. I almost convinced myself that I hadn't imagined the whole thing. Almost. As I opened the RV door, something didn't feel right. The RV should have smelled the same, a bit stale, that familiar outdoors scent of pine needles and campfires. But instead, something was off. Like raw meat mixed with some chemical tang. And that's how I found her. Hidden under my bed, curled up and broken, was Sarah, one of the part-timers from the nearby general store. We'd flirted a bit, harmless stuff. Everyone knew her face, her friendly smile. But her smile wasn't friendly now. Her eyes were open, frozen in terror. Crimson stained her t-shirt. Blood everywhere. I stumbled backward, retching in the dirt. I didn't scream, couldn't even manage that. My mind was a blank, reeling horror movie. That's when I heard him again. Not the whisper this time, but the crunch of leaves. Slow, deliberate, getting closer. I didn't wait around to find out who was out there, or what they wanted. I jumped in the RV and slammed it into gear. I gunned it down the dirt road, not even looking back. Only now, years later, do I dare to wonder at what I'd seen in those woods, the kind of cold heart that could leave Sarah like that, and why he chose me. Maybe as a warning, maybe as some sort of twisted game. But one thing I know for sure, I'll never camp alone again. I was hanging out with my buddies, Marshall and Trent, in the summer of 87, when we decided to take an epic road trip along the California coast. The plan was a simple one, gas up Marshall's old RV, grab some supplies, and just cruise. It wasn't about getting anywhere fast, it was about seeing the sights, catching some rays, and maybe meeting some beach babes. We started driving south windows down, music blasting, that classic rock that always makes you want to hit the open road. California offered everything we wanted, ocean views, stunning sunsets, a mix of sleepy beach towns and bustling cities. We even stumbled upon some cool surf spots that were a total surprise. One spot really stood out. I wish I could remember the name, but it was up in the northern part of the state. A little secluded, trees lining the sandy beach, and waves that were more like rolling swells than crashing breakers. We parked right there, ready to soak it all in. And for a while, it was paradise. We made camp, setting up a small grill, playing some cards, just the usual stuff to kill the afternoon. It was getting late, the last bit of sunlight dipping below the horizon, when things started to feel off. I don't know the right word for it. Maybe I just got paranoid being away from the familiar. First, I heard a rustling. It wasn't the breeze or the waves, but something in the brush that lined the sand. I'm not a skittish person, but my friends seemed oblivious, so I kept it on the down low for a bit. Then there was a snapping sound, louder this time, like a dry, heavy branch breaking under someone's foot. I scanned the shadows under the trees. Now I was starting to get goosebumps. That's when I saw it, a pair of eyes reflecting the dim light from the fire, just staring back at me, and not like deer eyes or another animal. They were human. Hey, fellas! I tried to keep my voice low. 
Something's out there. Marshall laughs, throwing his playing cards down. Ah, come on, man. You got the heebie-jeebies, that's all. Then Trent chimes in. Probably a raccoon. But I'm not buying it. I can feel it, you know? That tingle in your spine when you know you're not alone. And those eyes, man, they haven't blinked. I'm serious, I insist, looking at Trent. Did you hear that? Or am I going nuts? Trent's expression changes a little, brows furrowing. He sits up straighter. He might be starting to hear it too, that subtle rhythm of movement in the dry leaves, getting closer. I take a deep breath and address the darkness. Who's there? The thing in the trees doesn't reply. Not a word. Just that constant, predatory stare. Marshall's uneasy now, too, even though he's still putting on an act. Time crawls to a snail's pace. None of us dare break the silence with a sound. Then it happens. Out from the trees steps a man. Regular-sized, nothing too remarkable at first glance. Worn blue jeans, a flannel, a beat-up baseball cap. But the closer he gets, the more those details stick in your mind. Not like a familiar face you can pick from a crowd, but something about him, off. I can't place it, but it makes my skin crawl. Marshall pipes up. You lost, friend? He doesn't even respond, just keeps walking. No flicker of emotion in his face, eyes locked on us. It's like he's on autopilot, heading straight for the RV. This is not the time to be polite. I wouldn't step any closer, buddy. I warn, trying to sound confident. My heart's thumping against my ribs. He ignores me, walks right up to the RV steps. My instincts are screaming, fight or flight or freeze, and I'm frozen good. Marshall's beside me now, Trent just a little back. We watch this guy climb into the driver's seat and slam the door. The hell you think you're doing? Marshall yells, and that finally seems to shake me into action. I charge towards the RV. I wrench open the door, ready for a brawl. I get a good look at the guy at the wheel. His face is still void, but there's something new. Blood spatters across his shirt. He smells like iron and something else I can't place, something rotten. My first punch lands hard. I see a flash of surprise and pain ripple through his expression for a split second before it's blank again. I try another, but then I see it. He's reaching under the seat. My mind screams, Gun! I stagger back, yelling to the guys. Run! I don't wait to see if they follow. I turn and run towards the trees. It's pure adrenaline pumping through me. I hear Marshall and Trent's heavy footsteps pounding the sand just behind me. I hear the RV door swing open. A crack of a gunshot echoes over the crash of the waves. The only thought in my head is escape. Branches smack against my face, thorns tearing at my skin. I can't stop, can't slow down, even when I hear a sharp crack and pain explodes in my ankle. I bite back a scream, knowing any sound could be a death sentence. Marshall and Trent are still behind me. I hear their gasps for air mixing with the man's footsteps, now hot on our heels. The trees feel endless, like a dark labyrinth with no way out. It's getting darker, shadows are growing longer. Every rustle of leaves makes my heart leap in my chest. My vision spins, and I realize I'm losing blood. I stumble, hitting the ground hard. I can't risk losing them in the dark. With a burst of desperate energy, I yell, Keep running! I'll catch up! It's a lie, but maybe they'll buy it. Maybe it'll give them a fighting chance. Behind me, Footsteps pause. I don't wait to see if the man heard me. 
Every ounce of adrenaline forces me back onto my feet. I limp ahead as quickly as I can, ignoring the growing numbness in my body. Ahead, a flicker of light breaks through the trees. I push harder, lungs burning, heart ready to explode, the image of that blood-covered shirt the only thing in my mind. Suddenly, I burst out onto a road. A real road, blacktop and gravel. For a split second, hope surges through me. But my relief is short-lived as I see it, the RV. Headlights are on, engine roaring. I yell, but the engine noise covers my desperate screams. And even if Marshall and Trent could hear me, it's too late. The man emerges beside me, breathing raggedly. He's not even looking at me anymore, focused on the RV speeding away. Something glints in his hand in the dim light. A knife. My mind races. There's nowhere to go, no one to help. It'll be me next. But just when I think I'm done for, I see a flash of movement from the RV. Trent's head pops out of the passenger's window. And in his hands, Marshall's shotgun. A shout rings out, shattering the night. The man stumbles, a grunt escaping his lips. The knife clatters to the ground. He scrambles, scrambling towards the trees, desperate to disappear back into the shadows. Before I can process it, the RV screeches to a halt beside me. Get in! Marshall yells. He's holding the shotgun, knuckles white, eyes blazing. I don't hesitate, dragging myself into the passenger seat. Trent peels away from the curb, tires spinning, sending dust up around us. We don't stop until we reach a highway. Then we just drive. No destination in mind, just further and further away. We find a rest stop hours later. It's well lit, a few parked trucks rumbling. A place where we could finally breathe, get our bearings. That's when I see the true extent of my injuries. Blood everywhere. My pants soaked through, my ankles swollen like a balloon. Marshall insists on patching me up. He cleans the wounds carefully. It stings like hell, but I know we don't have the luxury of a hospital. The unspoken question hangs heavy in the air. Who was that guy? But we're all too exhausted, too shaken, to try to make sense of any of it. In the morning, the news reports start to trickle in. A body found in the woods near that beach. Mugshots flash across the screen. Missing hikers, drifters, faces of people who disappeared without a trace. No match for the guy who attacked us. We report what we saw, what happened. But I know the cops don't believe the full story. They give us those skeptical looks, like we're some stoner kids who saw Bigfoot. We ditch the RV, buy a few bus tickets, and scatter. We go back to our lives, our jobs acting like nothing happened. But that night is seared into my brain. Sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat, heart pounding, sure I can smell iron and rot. That beach, our road trip, everything became a whispered legend among us. A cautionary tale. And even years later, I avoid isolated beaches. I eye the tree line with suspicion. I never go camping without a weapon. That night, we didn't just run from a man. We ran from something darker, a force we still can't explain. Something out there, watching and waiting. It was in 86 I decided to take that big cross-country road trip. You know, the whole, find yourself, thing. Me, my trusty RV, and an open highway. Figured I'd always love the mountains, and what better place than the Appalachians for some stunning views. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, though. Those winding roads, the way the woods close in on you, it can get eerie fast, 
particularly when you're on your own. Found this old pull-off one day, figured it'd be a good spot to camp for the night. It looked abandoned, overgrown with weeds and a cracked asphalt path that led into the trees. Seemed peaceful enough at first. But the more I settled in, the more I got that feeling the hairs on the back of your neck standing on end. Not scared, exactly, just unsettled. Found an old picnic table near the woods. There were carvings all over it. You know, the stuff kids leave behind. Lover's initials, sloppy doodles. Except one carving caught my eye. Crudely etched the words, Watch out. A chill ran through me. I shrugged it off, told myself it was probably some local jerk trying to creep people out. Night fell, heavy and dark. I made a campfire, trying to push the unsettling feeling out of my mind. That's when I heard it, a rustling from the tree line, like something large was moving through the brush. Figured it was probably a deer. But it kept getting closer, those unseen eyes on me. Then silence. Anyone out there? I called out, my voice sounding too small in the vastness of the woods. No response. I tossed another log on the fire, the crackle breaking through the oppressive quiet. My nerves were buzzing, but I just chalked it up to being alone in the dark. I mean, woods are full of weird noises, right? Suddenly, a flicker of motion at the edge of the firelight. A human figure emerged. My heart jumped. An older man, probably late fifties, ragged at clothes. He was average height, stocky build, but it was his eyes that sent a wave of unease rolling over me. They were cold, empty. I tried to speak, but my mouth formed no words. The man just stood there, staring at me with those dead eyes. I could feel sweat breaking out on my forehead. Then he moved. Not a lunge, more of a slow, steady walk towards the RV. I finally found my voice. What do you want? I yelled, trying to sound brave but mostly just freaking out. He held up a finger to his lips, motioning for silence. My mind raced. Was that a threat? Did he have a weapon? Did he have backup? I scanned the shadows behind him, expecting more figures to emerge. But he was alone. He gestured towards the RV, then pointed back at the picnic table, drawing a finger across his neck in a slow, chilling motion. Then he simply turned and walked back into the woods, disappearing as silently as he'd appeared. I blinked, my pulse pounding in my ears. Had that just happened? I barely slept a wink that night. I kept telling myself I must have imagined the threat, that the whole thing was just my nerves. The next morning, I packed up fast, trying to leave that creepy place behind. As I pulled out, I glanced back at the picnic table. Right there, freshly carved over the old warning, was a new one, my name, Jeremy. I hit the gas, gravel flying. Didn't stop until I crossed two state lines. I still don't know who that man was. Some backwoods hermit, a serial killer in the making? Whatever it was, that experience soured me on solo camping for good. Even now, sometimes I hear a rustling in the leaves, a footstep, and I think of that night. I see his face, those eyes, and the carving on the table. This whole thing happened back in the fall of 97. Me, my buddy Joel, and his girlfriend at the time, Sarah, we loved to go camping. Joel and I've been best friends since elementary school and we've always done stuff like this together. Sarah was newer to the fold, but she was cool. Outgoing, loved the outdoors just as much as us. We decided on a road trip down to Tennessee, 
hitting up the Smokies. The drive was a blast. Joel and Sarah bickering playfully in the front, me kicking back taking in the views. Three days in, we found our spot, an out-of-the-way campsite nestled at the foothills of a particularly rugged mountain. Even pulling up, we all felt it, that special kind of peace only a wild place brings you. The RV got nestled into a clearing bordered by a gurgling stream and this massive web of pines that stretched up into the shadows of the mountainside. That first night was unreal. We grilled some burgers, cracked open some beers, and watched the sun dip behind the ridge. The whole sky lit up, the air filled with the sound of crickets, just pure, untouched nature. But me, even with the good vibes, something was a little off. Can't explain it. It was like this prickling at the back of my neck. The next morning, we laced up our boots and decided on a trail that snaked back towards the base of that mountain. This wasn't a stroll in the park kind of trail. It was narrow, overgrown, rocks and fallen branches everywhere. Still, we were making good time, joking, having fun. Until about half a mile in, I heard something. A distinct snap from deeper in the trees. I froze mid-stride, hands signaling for Joel and Sarah to stop. They looked at me, confused. What is it? Sarah whispered. Sure. I strained my ears towards the woods. And there it was again. Louder this time. Another snap. A rustle of leaves. Probably a deer or something, Joel said, but even he looked uneasy. We were all thinking it. There was something different about this. Felt too heavy, too close. We started walking again, but slowly, cautiously. And wouldn't you know it, just up ahead, the trees opened up to a clearing. Right smack in the middle stood this completely rusted-out Oldsmobile, vines snaking over it like some post-apocalyptic jungle gym. We all gaped at the thing. Holy crap, what is that doing out here? Sarah said. It gave me the creeps. Right then, I caught a whiff of something foul, metallic and musty. And as I scanned the trees surrounding the car, I saw it. Movement. Just a flicker in the foliage. My blood ran cold. We weren't alone. Let's go. No, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. We turned and practically sprinted back to the main trail, our breaths ragged. The rest of that day hung on a weird note. We tried to brush it off, chalk it up to our imaginations running wild. But that feeling... That nagging sense of being watched never fully left me. I didn't sleep well that night. Every rustle outside the RV had me sitting bolt upright. Joel must have noticed, because around dawn, he nudged me awake. Hey man, you okay? You've been tossing and tinning all night. Bad dream? Kinda, I said. Let's just head out of here. I got a bad feeling about this place. He hesitated, gave Sarah a concerned glance, then nodded. All right, if you're sure. But you gotta give me more than a bad feeling, man. I couldn't really explain it. I just knew. We packed up the RV with double time speed, our movements jittery. Finally, with everything stowed and Sarah in the passenger seat, I slid into the driver's side. Just as I flipped the ignition, Joel walked up and tapped on my window. His face was pale. Ah, uh, you might want to see this, he said. I walked over to where he was pointing. On the ground, by the passenger side door, were footprints. Not deer, not bear, those were distinctly human. And big ones at that. We looked back toward the trees where we'd seen the old car. Whoever left those tracks had been watching us. We hauled out of there in record time, tires spitting gravel as we bounced down the dirt road. 
I gunned that old RV as hard as she'd go, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Relief washed over us as we hit the interstate. Safe. Back to civilization. Couple of weeks later, Sarah calls Joel in a panic. It was all over the local news. A hiker went missing from a nearby campground, not too far from where we'd been. That description they put out, tall, thin, wearing ragged clothes. It matched the glimpse I'd caught of the figure back in the trees. Cops never found the missing guy. They searched for weeks, even had helicopters buzzing around the mountains. Nothing. It got put down as a possible animal attack, but I knew better. We all did. Joel and Sarah broke up not long after. She couldn't handle it, couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there. And honestly, I couldn't blame her. Me neither. That was the last time I ever went back to Tennessee. The mountains are still beautiful, I'm sure. But sometimes, at night, when the shadows stretch long and the darkness feels just a little too thick, I think back to that rusted car, that flicker in the trees, and those inhuman footprints by my RV door. I was cruising north on the Pacific Coast Highway this weekend my RV lumbering along the scenic route. My buddy Cade and I were stoked for a few nights of camping up in the Oregon wilderness. Pull over for a second, dude, Cade groaned. Think my breakfast burrito's making a break for freedom. I found a decent shoulder and Cade clambered out, clutching at his stomach. The ocean stretched out wide and glassy, a few surfers bobbing around like seals waiting for a wave. Further out, a lone fishing boat chugged along the horizon. You good, man? I yelled out, cracking my window. Yeah, just a wave of nausea. Probably should have skipped the extra hot sauce. He mumbled, leaning against the RV with a sickly pallor. Minutes later, he was gingerly climbing back in and I was easing back onto the highway. You sure you don't want to find a rest stop and settle that stomach? He shook his head grimly. No, I'll tough it out. We drove for a while, the coastal forest blurring by. My phone buzzed with a text from my girlfriend. I glanced down and lost a second of focus. Thump. I jerked my head up, slamming the brake. Cade hit the dashboard. What the hell? He yelled, rubbing his forehead. Something ran out. A deer? I peered out the windshield, my heart pounding. Nothing. Not a flicker of movement in the dense undergrowth. You okay? I turned to look at Cade. He was pale, his eyes wide. I, uh, think I'm gonna hurl. He lurched for the door fumbled with the handle, and stumbled outside just in time to paint the roadside bushes with the remains of his breakfast. I sighed, pulled over again, and grabbed a bottle of water from the cooler. As Cade rinsed his mouth out, I surveyed the road. Not another car in sight. It was unsettling. Even up here, you'd usually see a few vehicles passing by. I chalked it up to the early hour. We can head back if you want, I offered as Cade shuffled back in. This isn't worth getting sick over. Nah, keep going. Few more hours and we can chill at the campsite. Some fresh air will do me good. I kept my speed low, trying to spot whatever had darted across the road, but saw nothing. Cade was quiet, hunched over with a pained expression. A few hours passed. My stomach started rumbling guess Cade's bad burrito had become contagious. When we finally reached the turnoff for our campsite, a rusted metal sign warned. Wildcat Creek Campground, 12 miles. The dirt road snaked deep into the forest, and with each pothole, 
I hoped the RV would hold together. This place looks ancient, Cade mumbled, squinting into the gloom of the trees. I shrugged. Well, you picked it. Reviews Online said rustic, so... Rustic was a polite way of putting it. The campground was like stepping back in time, a handful of picnic tables scattered beneath towering pines, a couple of outhouses, and what looked like a hand pump for water. Not another soul around. Guess we got the VIP treatment, whole place to ourselves. I joked, trying to lighten the mood. Cade didn't crack a smile. He had gone from nauseous to flat-out sullen. Yeah, he muttered, his eyes darting into the trees. My unease grew. Look, if you really want, we can find another spot. No, it's fine. Cade forced a shaky smile. Let's just set up and relax. We got the RV settled and built a fire. The silence amplified the sounds of the forest, the wind through the pines, the crackle of kindling, a distant thump of something big hitting the ground. I tensed up. Did you hear that? I whispered. Probably just a big pine cone falling, Cade said, but his voice was unconvincing. We tried to make casual conversation, but the words hung awkwardly between us. As the light started to fade and the shadows deepened, an undeniable sense of wrongness settled over the campsite. Cade kept looking over his shoulder into the deepening gloom of the trees. By the time full darkness wrapped around us, my nerves were on edge. Let's head into the RV, I suggested. We can cook dinner, grab some beers, and chill inside. Cade nodded eagerly and we retreated into the lighted interior. I was locking the RV door when something caught my eye, a flicker of movement at the edge of the tree line. My heart gave a sickening lurch. A figure stood there, half hidden in the darkness. Cade, come look at this, I whispered urgently. Cade came over and peered out. I don't see anything. He was just there. A man, tall, standing at the tree line. Are you sure? Maybe just shadows playing tricks, man. Kate tried to sound dismissive, but I could tell he was spooked. For the next hour, we were trapped. Every creak of the RV, every rustle outside, made us jump. Our senses were on high alert, every shadow holding a potential threat. I gripped my phone considering our options. No reception bars. We were miles from the main road. Calling for help wasn't possible. A slow dread settled over me. I couldn't shake the feeling we were being watched, hunted. Who the hell was this guy out in the woods, and what did he want? Should we just leave? Drive back to the main road, even in the dark? Kate asked his voice barely above a whisper. I hesitated. The thought of driving down that winding road in the pitch black was terrifying, but so was the prospect of staying here. Let's give it a bit longer. I pulled binoculars from an overhead cabinet and scanned the tree line. I need to see. That's when I spotted it. Not a man, but a flash of metal reflecting the dwindling campfire light. Cade, I see something. I think it's a rifle. We both froze. He was out there, armed, and we were sitting ducks in this tin can of an RV. We have to do something, I said, panic edging into my voice. Maybe if we stay quiet, he'll move on. Cade whimpered, cowering against the wall. Suddenly, a sharp crack echoed through the night. The front right tire of the RV blew out, the vehicle rocking violently. We stumbled, grabbing onto the furniture to keep from falling. He shot the tire. He knows we're in here. Fear was a living thing, a monster clawing its way through my veins. We need a plan. I gasped, grabbing Cade by his arms and shaking him. 
he finally seemed to snap out of his frozen state. Can we fight him? Do you have anything? A bat, a knife? Cade frantically looked around. Just kitchen knives and a flimsy tire iron. Even as I said it, I knew it was pointless. This guy was playing with us, toying with us like a cat and a mouse. His next gunshot took out the left rear tire. He was immobilizing us. The smell of burned rubber filled the RV. The back exit. Cade breathed. Through the emergency window. It was our only shot. We scrambled to the back, fumbling with the rusty latch while the RV creaked ominously. Just as Cade squeezed through, I spotted a flicker of movement in the underbrush. He's coming! I screamed, clawing my way through the window. We landed on the ground, rolled, and then sprinted blindly through the trees. Branches whipped our faces, the darkness swallowing us whole. I could hear Cade's ragged breathing just ahead, and I prayed for the strength to keep going. A piercing whistle cut through the night. We're over here! This way! Cade's voice echoed, too loud, too desperate in the stillness. Silence. Then a chilling laugh rippled through the air. Wrong way. I hissed, pulling Cade down into a crouch behind a moss-covered log. He whimpered. He's hunting us. He's gonna find us. My stomach was knotted tight. We were cornered, the game reaching its final, brutal act. There! Cade pointed, his voice shaking. Through the darkness, I could see a faint glow of light moving towards us. We have to risk it, I said, stealing my resolve. We lurched forward, breaking out of cover and running towards that sliver of light. It was a stroke of luck or a cruel twist of fate. We stumbled upon a narrow, overgrown path, and in the distance I saw the shape of a small cabin. Relief washed over me, then evaporated as another gunshot shattered the night, the bullet whistling past my ear. I barreled forward, my feet pounding the dirt. The cabin grew closer, a dim light shone in one window, casting an eerie glow. Help! I yelled, slamming a fist against the wooden door. Please, someone help us! The door creaked open a crack. A face, gaunt and lined, peered out. What in God's name? It was an older man, his white hair unkempt, eyes wide with a mix of shock and suspicion. I rambled out our story, pushing past him into the dim interior of the cabin. Cade followed, slamming the door shut behind him. We were momentarily safe, but I knew it wouldn't last. The old man, who introduced himself as Elias, took in the sight of us, disheveled, eyes wide with terror. Heard gunshots, he muttered, shaking his head slowly. Been trouble lurking in these woods for months. Trouble? I asked, my voice hoarse. What kind of trouble? Elias narrowed his eyes. Escaped convicts, drifters. The violent kind. A body was found up near the ridge a few weeks back. Thought maybe it was an animal attack, but... He trailed off, the implication sinking in like a cold stone in my gut. There's someone out there, in the woods, Cade whimpered, his words echoing the chilling truth. We were trapped with a madman somewhere outside. Elias grabbed an ancient-looking shotgun from the corner of the room. Guess I never put stock much in locking doors, he muttered. Stay quiet. Hours ticked by, each minute weighing on us like sacks of stones. No more gunshots. No more signs of our pursuer, but the silence was deafening, the tension unbearable. Finally, as dawn began to paint the sky with a pale light, we heard the crunch of footsteps outside. I pressed myself to the window, heart pounding. It was him. The shadowy figure emerged from the trees, 
rifle glinting in his hand. He moved slowly, deliberately towards the cabin, not an ounce of hesitation in his stride. And that's when it hit me, his confidence, the way he seemed so unafraid of the daylight. This wasn't some crazed recluse or a desperate convict on the run. He was in control, the predator, and we were the cornered prey. Elias raised his shotgun, a flicker of determination crossing his lined face. I don't know what happened next, whether Elias got a shot off, or if our hunter vanished back into the trees as quickly as he had appeared. All I knew was that in the aftermath, there was only the silence of the woods, broken by the ragged sound of our own breathing. It's May, and I'm headed to Yosemite National Park, always been a dream of mine. My wife, Anya, she doesn't like camping much, so I'm rolling solo. My name's Elston, by the way. Got myself a sweet little RV, the works, shower, kitchen, whole deal. Just the way I like it, you know? Independent, out in the wild. Been driving for days now and I finally hit those towering sequoias. It's breathtaking, man. That crisp mountain air, the scent of pine. I park at one of the upper campgrounds, a bit more isolated than those down in the valley. Perfect. I want the real deal, not some tourist trap with screaming kids. First day is pure bliss. I hike some lower trails, take it easy, just soak in those massive trees. I cook up a storm on my camp stove that evening, feeling like a modern-day mountain man. Turn in early, and I'm out like a light. Next morning, I'm up with the sun, ready for a big one, the Upper Yosemite Falls Trail. It's long, steep, but man, those views are supposed to be killer. I pack a bag, extra water, the usual hiking gear. Hit the trailhead, and I'm one of the first out. That alone time on the trail, it's the best. Few hours in, I pass some folks heading back down. They warn me about a bear sighting further up. Figures, I think. You're always told to be cautious. I make some noise, clap my hands a bit, and keep on pushing. The views, they don't disappoint. You get up high, the valley opens up like this massive painting. I'm snapping pictures like crazy. I pull over on this rocky outcrop, perfect for lunch with that kind of view. That's when I see it. Up the trail, just past the bend, there's this flash of movement. Not an animal, for sure. Too tall, too, deliberate. I hold my breath, straining to see better. Heart's starting to pound a bit. There it is again, definitely a person, a man, just kinda standing there, watching. Not moving towards me, just watching. Something about him feels off. City clothes, for one thing. You don't see tailored pants and a dress shirt out on Yosemite trails. And something about the stillness, the way he's holding himself. I get goosebumps. Now, I'm not the jumpy type. But out here, alone, your mind starts to play tricks on you. I yell out, Hey! You lost? Just want to break that weird tension. The man doesn't flinch. Not a sound. My lunch is losing its appeal fast. I pack up, keep him in my peripheral vision as I make my way back down the trail. Every rustle, every snap of a twig, I swear it's him following. The whole way back, I keep glancing over my shoulder. He's not there, not that I can see, but the unease sticks with me. By the time I'm at my campsite, I'm shaken. That night's a rough one. Every creaking branch outside my RV is him, lurking in the shadows. I toss and turn, barely get a wink. Next morning, I'm on edge. But hey, paid for the campsite, 
and I'm determined to make the most of this trip. I tell myself, probably just some weird hiker dude got lost. Still, I stick to the more popular trails, ones crowded with families and tour groups. Safety in numbers, right? The weirdness just escalates. Later that day, I'm out taking sunset photos when I swear I catch movement in my mirrors. I whip around, a figure ducks behind one of those massive sequoias. I call out, run over, but nothing. Nobody there. Maybe I'm seeing things, the stress getting to me. That night, I hear the footsteps. Slow, crunching, methodical. They circle my RV. My blood runs cold. I grab my flashlight, throw open the door, and shine it into the darkness. Of course, there's nothing there. The next morning, I can't take it anymore. I break camp in record time. I don't care about the amazing hikes I still had planned. I'm not sleeping another night here with him out there. Whatever he is, stalker, creep, escaped convict, I don't know. I don't want to find out. As I'm driving down the mountain, I pass a ranger station. I debate stopping, telling them about, about whatever the hell that was. But how do you explain it? The figure in the trees, the footsteps that vanish? They'll think I'm crazy, or worse, that I'm messing around. I hit the road and don't look back. I'm miles away when my phone buzzes. It's Anya. Hey babe, you okay? Tried calling a few times, no signal? I gripped the steering wheel. Ah, uh, yeah? Had to cut the trip short. Cell service was garbage, got a bit spooked out there, you know. She's quiet for a moment. Want to talk about it? I open my mouth, but the words catch. Instead, I say, Nah, it was silly, no big deal. I'm almost back now, see you soon. I pull off the highway, needing some air. As I walk, I replay the last few days in my head. There's a missing piece. Some detail my mind won't let me see, like a blurred spot in a photograph. It nags at me. I look up, scanning the tree line. That same tightness returns to my chest. I'm not crazy. He was real. He was out there. And there's a chance he's still out there. Worse, maybe he followed me. My eyes dart to the rearview mirror every few seconds, scanning for any sign of a car on my tail. Weeks go by, and I try to shake it off. Just some weirdo in the woods, playing some twisted game. But the gnawing feeling in my gut doesn't fade. I install security cameras at my house. I take different routes to work. I can't look at a stand of trees without getting flashbacks. Anya notices. She worries, even when I try to play it off like nothing. Then, one day, a package arrives. No return address, just my name. My heart drops as I rip it open. Inside is a single Polaroid photo. It's my RV, parked at my campsite in Yosemite. And there, in the background, a blur in the tree lean, it's him. The man in the tailored clothes. Watching. Anya's right there when I open it. I don't try to hide anything anymore. She gasps, puts her hand over her mouth. I just stare at the photo, speechless. The proof is in my shaking hands. We have to go to the police, she says, her voice firm. We do. Laying it all out for the officers is humiliating. They're patient, but skeptical. I know how it sounds, a shadowy figure, some grainy photo. But they humor me, take a statement, promise to look into it. I know that's cop speak for. Don't hold your breath. We head home that night under a heavy cloud. Nothing will come of the police report. He's a ghost, just like I first thought. Out there somewhere. 
Days turn into weeks. The tension hangs thick in our household. I jump at every shadow, every creak of the house at night. Anya, she tries her best to keep things normal, cheerful. But I see the worry in her eyes. She sleeps with a kitchen knife under the pillow, for God's sake. Then one morning, a news story breaks nationwide, a missing hiker. Last seen in Yosemite. The photo they flash. It's that same goddamn tailored shirt, those dress pants. Same build as the figure that haunted me. Suddenly, things aren't in my head anymore. The police are all over our place within the hour. The photo I have is evidence now, proof I wasn't crazy. They turn up reports of other missing hikers, disappearances stretching back years. It's him, has to be. He becomes a media sensation, the Yosemite stalker, they call him. Overnight, I'm the guy who got away, the one who lived to tell the tale. They have me on the local evening news recounting everything, the photo I'd received held up for the cameras. We go into protective custody for a while, moved around to some safe houses. The cops seem hopeful they'll catch him, use me as bait maybe. But I know better. He's too calculated, too careful. If he wanted me dead, I'd be dead. This is something else, a game of cat and mouse, only he knows the rules to. A year passes. Then another. The investigation goes cold. The media frenzy dies down. Life returns to a twisted sense of normalcy. I still skin crowds, certain I'll see that face again. Anya, she never really recovers. The fear lingers, even if she tries to hide it. The spark in our relationship, it's dimmed. Every so often, a new missing person case pops up near Yosemite. The pattern fits. They never find the bodies. I wonder how many more are out there, lost in those woods. Wonder how many times he's watched someone, picked his next target. Wonder if he's watching me now. It's late May when I hit Sequoia National Park. I'm Bramwell, by the way. Folks call me just Bram, mostly. Always had that itch to hit the road alone. Figured an RV was the way to do it right, not some cramped tent. Got all the comforts of home out here in the wilds. This place, it's special, even bigger than the photos. Those giant trees, man, it's like looking up at gods. I park up at a lower campground near the park entrance. Don't want too much isolation, at least for my first swing through. First day's easy hikes. Get my bearings straight, admire those big bois. Back at my RV I whip up a surprisingly decent steak dinner on the campfire. Life's good, you know? Next morning, though, things start to get twisty. I decide on a longer, out-of-the-way trail. Should be a quiet one. About a mile in, I pass this elderly couple heading back down. They give me the usual friendly smiles. But then the old man pauses and asks, You headed up to Hollow Creek? I say, yeah, that's the plan. Well, he says, frowning a bit, take a look around when you get there. Heard tell of something strange going on up that way. I brush it off, some old-timer yarn. The hike in is stunning, though. One of those places where the only sound is your boots on the dirt, the birds, the rustling leaves. It's peaceful. Hollow Creek is this meadow tucked between some granite peaks. Real pretty. But as soon as I set foot in it, the hairs on my arms stand on end. It's hard to explain. Like the air's heavier, the color's just a bit off. But there's something else, something concrete. Right there, clear as day, footprints. Not bare, not deer, human-shaped. Problem is, there's nobody around for miles. 
and these prints stain mine, smaller, like a woman's, and barefoot. Now, I'm not the spooky type. But out here, alone, your mind plays tricks. I follow those bare footprints a bit, tell myself it's just some weirdo hiker, or someone messing with me from the other direction. But they creep away further into the woods, and I get this prickling feeling, like eyes on me. I cut it short. Hike back with that heavy air feeling hanging around me. That night I can't shake it. I'm usually good at dropping into a deep sleep out in nature, but not this time. Every rustle, every owl call makes me jump. I leave the lights on in my RV, which feels real childish, like I'm afraid of monsters under the bed. It doesn't get better. Next couple of days I stay on the main trails, ones crowded with families and tour groups. No more weird vibes. I try to laugh it off, those footprints, the feeling of being watched. But the unease is there, under the surface. On the fourth day, I decide to drive up to the King's Canyon part of the park. Fresh start, you know? I find this cozy pull-off near the road, figure I'll post up, do some remote work in the mornings, explore in the afternoons. That plan goes to hell pretty damn fast. Second morning, I'm outside sipping coffee, just soaking in the view. Then I see it, a man standing way down by the tree line, staring straight up at me. It's a long way off, but something about this guy feels off. He's not a ranger, no uniform. Dress real plain, dark clothes that don't fit right with the wilderness around him. And he's just, still, watching. My heart does that panic stutter thing in my chest. I don't call out, don't wave. Just grab my coffee and ease myself back inside my RV, keeping an eye on him. He stays there, unmoving, for maybe a half hour. Then, he turns and melts back into the trees. I lock the RV up tight, sit there with my pulse doing its own crazy dance. Finally, I risk peeking out. He's gone. It's broad daylight. I tell myself he's gotta be another hiker or something. But I know that's a lie. I know he wasn't just passing by. That day and the next, I go full-blown recluse. I don't answer the door for the campground host when he stops by. I keep the shades down, feeling idiotic and paranoid. But there's this itch between my shoulder blades, like he's still out there. I debate packing up again, just getting the hell out, but the rational part of my brain wins out. What am I running from? Some oddball who likes staring at people? I pull myself together, take a deep breath. If he shows up again, I'll confront him, see what his deal is. The next morning, I wake to a sound so faint I almost don't register it. A knock on the window beside my bed. I sit bolt upright, heart pounding hard enough to shake the whole damn RV. There he is, pressed up against the glass. Not some lost hiker. Not some weirdo. It's the same guy. He's older than I thought. Lean, with a weathered face, shaved head gleaming in the sun. His eyes are dark, intense. He mouths something I can't make out, raps on the glass again. And then he smiles. It ain't a friendly smile. It's slow, curling, like he knows a secret about me. A secret he's about to share. My whole body is ice. I can't even scream, the shock pins me to the mattress. He keeps smiling, and I realize, he can see me. He knows I'm here. I scramble back, trying to find something, anything. Phone? Nope, bedside table. Keys? Damn it, they're on the kitchen counter. Something to hit him with. He raps on the glass again, more insistent. Then... He holds up one hand, fingers splayed, and slowly curls them like he's beckoning me. My breath hitches in my chest. 
He knows I'm here and he wants me to come outside. I'm trapped. If I stay here, he might try to break in. The RV ain't exactly Fort Knox. But if I go outside, what the hell is he going to do to me? Panic claws at my throat. There's the woods down a slope behind me. If I can make it there, maybe lose him in the trees. But I'd be out in the open to get there. Perfect target. My eyes dart around the RV. The toolbox. Too far, he'll see me moving. Then I spot it, the tire iron under my seat. I inch forward on my knees, keeping my body low, eyes still on the window. The bald guy is scanning the clearing, but hasn't turned back toward me. I carefully slide under the driver's seat, hand scrabbling for the cold metal. My fingers wrap around it just as a shadow falls over the window. He's pressed back against the glass, that smile wider than ever. He points, not at me, but behind me. My heart leaps into my throat. Before I can even think, I twist around, the tire iron raised like a baseball bat. But there's nothing there. Only the empty passenger seat. Then... A heavy thud on the roof, like a sack of rocks has been dropped. The RV shakes. I whimper, my vision going white hot. He's climbed up top. There's nowhere to run. I huddle under the dashboard, clutching that tire iron with white knuckles. I'm sobbing now, big gasping breaths that seem to fill the whole RV. I hear a scraping sound as he moves across the roof then another thud as he jumps to the front. My lungs are on fire. I'm gonna hyperventilate and pass out, and this is how it ends. Not fighting back, not trying, but just cowering like a dog. Then that rage sparks. Not terror, but pure, blistering anger. At him, at myself. I'm not gonna be another victim in another damn news story. I'm not dying curled up in a ball in my fancy tin can. Clenching the tire iron, I shove myself out from under the dashboard. The bold guy has reappeared at the window, and he's messing with the lock, trying to get the door open. Without a second thought, I hurl myself at him, screaming bloody murder. The window shatters, the tire iron connects. I feel the solid impact against bone as he bellows in surprise. I strike again and again, grunting with the effort, a wild animal backed into a corner. He lurches back, blood trickling down his forehead, and tumbles off the side of the RV. He lands hard, swearing, but he's up in a flash, scrambling into the trees. I stand there, heart pounding, body trembling. There's shattered glass all over me, and my arm throbs where I strained it. I could run after him, try to finish this, but what if there's more of them? He could be leading me into a trap. A wave of nausea crashes over me and I turn away, stumbling back into the RV. I grab my keys, hands barely working, and lock every single door before collapsing onto the bed tears streaming down my face. It takes hours for the shaking to subside, hours before the first sliver of clear thought returns. I have to get out of here. I have to go to the police. The drive to the nearest ranger station is a blur. I blurred out the whole story to the shocked ranger, showing him the broken window, my blood-stained tire iron. They're skeptical, but concerned. They send a patrol car back with me, search the area, but find nothing. No trace of the bald guy. The whole time, I'm watching the tree line, sure he's going to pop out at any moment. That night, they offer me temporary accommodation in the staff housing. But even surrounded by people, I can't sleep. The woods outside the window feel like they're crawling, filled with eyes. They investigate. Run my plates, my history. Turns out I'm clean, but that doesn't explain a damn thing. 
They call neighboring parks, see if anyone else matches my description of the bald guy. There's a few oddball characters, hermits, poachers, but no solid leads. They tell me to go home. Then I'm probably on edge after some weird experience, that these things happen in the wilderness. They advise me to check in at another station when I leave the park, just in case. The drive home is agonizing. Every car behind me makes me jumpy. At rest stops, I triple-check the locks, barely sleep. I skin the shadows around my house before finally going inside. It feels tainted, even with the security system armed. I spend nights on the couch with the TV blaring and a kitchen knife under my pillow. The news covers it, of course. They dub him the Park Stalker, some spin on the Yosemite guy from a while back. It becomes a curiosity, a true crime podcast episode. They never find him. They never find anyone matching his description. He becomes a ghost story, whispered about around campfires. And I become a footnote, the guy who got away. I'm in the Ozarks in Arkansas this trip. Name's Everett, Everett Sloan, but everyone just calls me Ev. Figured a road journey through the mountains might break up the monotony between office jobs. Big believer in the solo experience out in the wild, you know? Disconnect, get in touch with nature, all that good stuff. First few nights are smooth sailing. Park my RV at those designated campgrounds, mingle a bit with the families and the retirees. I've even got one of those portable campfire pits, break it out as the sun sets, maybe roast some marshmallows. It's real wholesome out there. Then I decide to seek out a more isolated spot. See, I hear these stories online about backcountry boondocking. Folks parking for the night at the edge of National Forest figured I'd give it a whirl, get a taste of that real off-the-grid life. Turns out, finding a good boondocking spot ain't easy. Most of the pull-offs are narrow, uneven, right up against the highway. After a couple frustrating hours, I find this dusty track winding deeper into the trees. Perfect. I bump along it until I reach a clearing with a fire ring. Someone's been here before. Good enough for me. As I'm settling in, it strikes me how quiet it is. I mean, I expected quiet. But this is different. No crickets, no frogs down by the creek, not even the rustle of critters in the leaves. Just silence hanging in the air, heavy as a blanket. I shake it off. Must be the change in elevation probably messing with my ears. That night, I cook up a solid dinner, the works, steak, potatoes, got the whole deal going. Afterward, I kick back in my camping chair and just take it all in. Stargazing out here, it's unreal. No light pollution, those stars are popping. I must doze off, cause the next thing I know, I'm awake with a jolt. It's pitch black, the fires died down, and I'm cold, deep in my bones. And there's that silence again, but amplified. It's like the air's been sucked out of the forest. Then I see them, two eyes, glowing in the darkness across the clearing. At first, I think it's an animal, deer, maybe. But these eyes, they're too high, and too intelligent. Whatever it is, it's big. I grab the flashlight off my camp table, shine it out towards the eyes, and what I see, it ain't no deer. It's a man, standing stock still on the opposite side of the fire ring, tall, lanky, dressed in ragged clothes that blend in with the darkness. His eyes are fixated on me, shining yellow in the flashlight beam. He's not making a sound just staring with this intensity that sends chills down my spine. My mind races. There's gotta be a town nearby, 
somewhere I can get help. My phone's in the RV. If I make a dash for it, maybe. No, he's too close. I take in a shaky breath, deciding to try to de-escalate. Hey, man, I call out, trying to sound casual. Just passing through. You all right out there? He doesn't respond, just keeps staring. I mean no harm. I try again, sweat starting to beat on my forehead. Just looking for a place to spend the night is all. Still nothing. I stand slowly. My pocket knife is in my left pocket. Could I get to it in time if he lunges? I try to keep my voice steady. If you want some food or supplies, let me know. I'm happy to share. The man remains motionless. Then, he tilts his head slightly, like a bird listening for a worm. His eyes seem to bore into me, as if he's reading my very soul. That's when the sounds start. At first, they're faint. A twig snapping, dry leaves crunching. Then they get closer, coming from multiple directions around the clearing. I spin the flashlight beam wildly, but see nothing but those glowing eyes in the tree line. Suddenly, a low growl echoes through the woods. Then another, and another. They're circling me. Panic explodes in my chest. I snatch up the flashlight, sprint for the RV, and fumble with the keys. The growls are louder, filled with this hungry edge that makes my blood run cold. I fling open the RV door, dive inside, and slam it shut, locking all the deadbolts. Through the windows, I see shadows flitting between the trees. They don't attack the RV, just circle it endlessly, growling and snarling. My heart is pounding so hard it hurts. I dig out my phone, praying for a signal. Nothing. I'm cut off, trapped. Hours go by. The growling fades, replaced again by that oppressive silence. Finally, as the first hint of dawn paints the sky, there's a scraping sound on the RV roof. Then another. My stomach drops. I inch closer to the window and peek out. They're up there, a dozen pairs of glowing eyes peering down at me. The bald man is crouched there too, staring at me with the same unnerving intensity. I stumble back, away from the window. In my head, I'm already seeing the news headlines. Camper found mauled to death in mysterious animal attack. Then, as quickly as they appeared, the eyes vanish. I hear scrambling on the roof as they retreat back into the trees. The silence descends again, but this time it's different. Broken. I wait an hour, maybe two, before I muster the courage to peek out again. The clearing is empty. With trembling hands, I turn the key in the ignition and back the RV out of there as fast as it'll go. I don't stop driving until I hit the nearest interstate. Find a rest stop, and just collapse, shaking and barely able to breathe. A trucker stops, asks if I'm all right. I manage to mumble something about food poisoning before he backs away slowly. I was on a month-long RV trip through the Northwest. My name's Ezekiel, by the way. Just me, the wide open road and the comforting rumble of that big diesel engine beneath my feet. It was my kind of peace, especially after the mess of a divorce I'd just been through. This particular evening found me parked on the edge of the Malheur National Forest in Oregon. It was a remote spot, the kind I prefer. Not a designated campsite, just a wide dirt pull-off along the highway. Sun was dipping below the tree line, painting the sky with streaks of pink and orange. It was downright beautiful. I stepped out of the RV, beer in hand, and breathed in the crisp mountain air. That's when I heard it, 
the faint sound of snapping twigs off in the woods. I shrugged it off at first. Could be anything, right? Plenty of critters roam these parts. But then I heard it again, a bit closer this time. Suddenly, I wasn't so relaxed. I scanned the darkening tree lean, heart quickening in my chest. Nothing. I told myself to chill out. It was probably just my post-divorce nerves running a little high. Still, something fell off. I took a cautious step back toward the RV, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of movement. That's when I saw the first flicker of light through the trees. Firelight. My gut clenched. There shouldn't have been anyone else out here, let alone a damn campfire this close to the road. My mind raced. Was it just some fellow camper? Could be, but something didn't add up. Why not set up camp closer to the pull-off? Why be tucked away in the woods? A shiver ran down my spine. I darted back inside the RV, locking the door behind me. Peering out the window, I watched the flickering light. It was still there, and it seemed to be getting closer. I fumbled for my phone. No signal. Of course not. My stomach dropped. Then I remembered the handgun I kept under the driver's seat. A relic from my ex-wife's gun that days, but I was starting to be grateful for her paranoia. My shaking hands loaded the gun. I crept to the driver's seat and risked a peek out the front window. Moonlight cut through the trees and I swear I saw a figure standing near the firelight. Just a tall, dark shape, but human, definitely human. My heart pounded against my ribs. Who the hell was out there, and why were they stealthily moving towards my RV? I gripped the gun tighter, adrenaline rushing through me like icy water. The figure disappeared back into the darkness. I waited, frozen, listening for any sound. Nothing. Then, a blood-curdling scream shattered the silence. It was a woman's voice, filled with terror, cut off abruptly. My mind raced through horrifying scenarios. Was the figure attacking her? What if he was coming for me next? I had to do something. I couldn't just cower here, but could I even bring myself to fire a gun? My hands shook on the weapon my vision blurred with conflicting waves of fear and desperation. A low thud echoed from outside, something hitting the side of the RV. Then another thud, harder this time. My stomach lurched. He was here. I heard a scraping noise, metal on metal. The figure was at the door handle, trying to force it open. A growl rumbled from outside, not an animal growl, a low, guttural human snarl. Terror propelled me into action. I lurched to the front, gun raised, and yanked the blinds open. Moonlight washed over the figure, momentarily freezing him outside the driver's side window. What I saw made my blood turn to ice. A tall man, wiry and filthy, a tangled mess of hair covering most of his face. But what stuck with me were his eyes wild, filled with a crazed intensity I couldn't fathom. He stared at me, teeth bared in a snarl, and raised a bloodied axe high in the air. He swung that axe down in a vicious arc, shattering the driver's window. Glass exploded inward, peppering my face. I screamed and flinched back, dropping the gun to the floor. Desperation clawed inside me. I had to get out of here. The filthy man's face twisted into a grotesque smile, one hand reaching into the broken window, fumbling for the door latch. On instinct, I scrambled across the seat, throwing myself at the passenger door. With a curse, I ripped it open, tumbling out onto the dirt road. I was up and running before my brain fully registered what I was doing, adrenaline pushing me into blind flight. Behind me, the man roared in frustration, stumbling out of the RV after me. 
The woods were pitch black, the towering trees like monstrous claws reaching out in the night. My breath burned in my lungs, my legs pumped, fear propelling me forward. I didn't know where I was going, just that I couldn't stop. He was gaining on me. I could hear his rasping breath and the thud of his footsteps closing in. Panic fueled me. I couldn't let him catch me, couldn't let him take me like he did that woman. A sob tore from my throat. Why did I have to run into this sicko on my trip? What the hell was he even doing out here? A root snagged my foot, and I went sprawling to the ground, a cry escaping me as I braced for impact. The forest floor was cold and damp against my skin, the smell of pine needles sharp in my nostrils. I rolled onto my back, expecting to see the man and towering over me, axe raised. Nothing. Just the faint outline of tree branches against the dimly lit sky. Had I lost him? Before I could get my bearings and push myself up, a hand clamped over my mouth, stifling my scream. Another shadowed figure, this one smelling of stale sweat and something metallic, like blood. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm against my ribs. Was this it? Was I done for? I struggled uselessly. His grip was like iron. Rough fabric was shoved against my nose, and then a sickly sweet scent invaded my nostrils. Chloroform. My mind screamed in protest, the world swirling dizzily as my thrashing movements slowed. My eyes fluttered, blackness encroaching from all sides. When I opened my eyes, the world was tilting and throbbing. Pain pulsed through my skull as I tried to sit up, only to find my wrists and ankles bound to a rough wooden chair. My muddled brain tried to make sense of my surroundings. I was in what looked like a crudely built shack, or maybe a large shed. Flickering lamplight cast long, grotesque shadows on the walls. The air was thick with the smell of mildew and something else, something foul that made my stomach churn. He was sitting across from me, the man-man. He'd cleaned up somewhat, his face visible now. Just an ordinary-looking guy, late thirties maybe, with lank brown hair and a scraggly beard. But those eyes, they still held that same wildness that made my skin crawl. What do you want? My voice cracked, barely a whisper. He smiled, a twisted, unsettling thing. Well now, Zeke, he rasped. That's the thing, isn't it? My mind raced. How did he know my name? I, uh, I need to get back. I choked out, my gaze sweeping the room, looking for an escape route, some way out of this nightmare. The man stood, moving slowly, tauntingly close. He plucked a bloodstained knife from a nearby table. My heart hammered against my ribs as he circled me like a predator. I can't let you go, he said, his voice low and raspy. You saw my face. No witnesses. I squeezed my eyes shut, my body trembling. This was it. A loud crack echoed through the shack, like a gunshot. The man-man shrieked, his knife clattering to the floor. He staggered gripping a bloodied wound on his shoulder. In the dim light, I saw another figure standing in the doorway, a figure holding a rifle. Took you long enough. I choked out, a hysterical laugh bubbling from my throat. Relief flooded through me, but it was quickly replaced by a deep, unsettling dread. This wasn't over, not by a long shot. I looked at the man across from me, the man-man and an icy chill crept over me. Even with pain twisting his features, his eyes never left me, filled with that same crazed intensity, with a silent promise. This was far from over. Come on, old man, let's get you out of here, the stranger with the rifle said in a gruff but surprisingly gentle voice. He was a towering figure, dressed in warm camouflage gear, 
face half hidden behind a salt and pepper beard. As my rescuer cut the ropes binding my ankles, I found my voice again. The woman, I rasped. He, there was a woman out there, he attacked her. The stranger nodded, his face grim. I heard. Don't worry, help's on the way. Got a signal out on my shortwave radio. Sheriff should be here any time now. A wave of relief washed over me, then a fresh rush of adrenaline. He has a partner, I said urgently. The one who knocked me out. You need to find him, too. The stranger helped me to my feet. My legs were like jelly, numb and tingling after being bound for so long. He gave me a reassuring pat on the shoulder. We'll lock him both up, don't you worry. Got a place you can stay for now? My cabin's not fancy, but it's warm. He seemed like the kind of guy who lived alone in the forest for a reason, but right now... He was my only hope. I nodded gratefully. My RV's still back at the pull-off, I said, but I shuddered at the thought of going back there alone. If they really did catch the man-man and his partner, it would be a nightmare to retrieve my vehicle and all my belongings from the crime scene. We were moving now, deeper into the woods, away from the shack and its horrors. A faint glow appeared through the trees ahead, his cabin, no doubt. As we got closer, the smell of wood smoke and something like roasting meat drifted towards us. My stomach growled, and I realized I hadn't eaten in hours. That smells amazing. I ventured, my voice still raspy but stronger than before. He chuckled, a surprisingly warm sound. Venison stew. Hope you like it. You'll need something hearty after what those bastards put you through. His words sent shivers down my spine. I risked a sideways glance at him. His expression was unreadable, buried beneath that bushy beard. What was this guy's story anyway? Living out here all alone, happening upon my little crime scene so conveniently. We reached a small clearing. A modest log cabin nestled against the tree lean. Smoke curled from the chimney, and warm light spilled from the windows. For a moment, it looked like the most inviting place in the world. Maybe a bit of normalcy was exactly what I needed after tonight's horrors. And then, like a whiplash, a memory struck me, the second figure, the one who used chloroform on me. Before I could react... The old man was behind me, his calloused hand again clamping down over my mouth. Panic surged through me, but there was a sharp, stinging pinch in my neck and my vision blurred. As I fell into darkness, it hit me like a ton of bricks. This was no rescue, this was a trap. The old man wasn't a savior, he was the third accomplice. And as the world spun away into blackness... I couldn't shake the chilling thought that they clearly weren't done with me yet. My eyes fluttered open, my head pounding like a bass drum. I was on the floor of the dimly lit cabin, my hands and feet bound once again, this time with what felt like barbed wire. I jerked violently but it was no use, the wire cut into my skin. Through a fog of pain and confusion, I tried to take in my surroundings. This wasn't the same room I'd been in with a madman. Rough-hewn walls, tools hanging haphazardly, the distinct smell of animal hides and grease. Was this a hunting cabin? Footsteps echoed from somewhere down a short hallway. My blood ran cold as the madman emerged from the shadows, that same cruel grin on his face. He crouched down in front of me, tilting his head to the side. Guess you learned the hard way why it's not so smart to go snooping around where you're not welcome, huh, Zeke? His voice was a mocking sing-song. My voice quivered when I spoke. What's going on? Why? Why? He laughed, and the sound was like nails on a chalkboard. You really think we're just gonna let you walk out of here? 
After seeing our pretty faces? He leaned close, his eyes locking with mine. You might have slowed us down, Zeke. But it ain't gonna end well for you, I promise. A wave of despair crashed over me. South close. I had been so close to getting away. I thought for a wild moment about yelling, struggling, just to make some noise, anything to grab the attention of that grizzled old man with the rifle. But the madman's eyes glittered with a sadistic promise. He'd enjoy hurting me for my defiance. My body still burned with residual adrenaline and the ache where he'd injected me. He must have used some sort of tranquilizer, enough to keep me down but aware. The madman stood, stretching lazily. Well, that was fun. Wasn't it, Zeke? Now to business. Me and the boys, we run a little operation here. He smirked. Keeps us fed. My stomach churned at the implications. What kind of operation? You're pretty smart. He chuckled, a sharp, nasty sound. You must have guessed some of it already. Hikers, lost campers, people like you who stumble into our woods where they ain't wanted. Well, you gotta disappear, and folks like us, we gotta eat, right? The blood roared in my ears. Not, no. They couldn't be. A gruesome memory clawed its way to the surface. The woman's terrified scream, the smell in the shack, the stew in the old man's cabin. Oh yeah, he crooned like he could read my thoughts. Bet your stew's tasting real different now, huh? Truth is, we got a taste for the long pig. It's a good business, out here where nobody asks too many questions. I tried to shut the images out, the revulsion threatening to overwhelm me. Desperation fueled a sudden burst of movement. I lunged forward, not toward him but toward a rusty hatchet propped carelessly against the far wall. He must have seen my intent. He was faster, kicking hard into the side of my knee. Bone cracked, pain shooting through me like a white-hot knife. I crumpled, a choked sob tearing from my throat. It was no use. The madman grinned, strolling over to retrieve the hatchet. He wagged a finger in my face. Should have listened, Zeke. Nobody outsmarts us. Nobody escapes us. He hoisted the hatchet above his head, its rusty blade gleaming in the dim light. A sudden crashing noise outside the cabin made him freeze. What the hell? He muttered, his eyes darting toward the door. The old man must be back. Time was running out. In that split second of distraction, I found a flicker of hope. Maybe it was just a wild animal. Maybe I could somehow. I forced my pain-racked body into motion, lunging for his ankle. He half-turned, his grip on the hatchet faltering, a startled curse escaping his lips. I pulled hard. He lost his balance, tumbling toward the floor. The hatchet flew from his hand and skidded across the rough wooden floorboards. I couldn't think, only reach, scramble, my hand catching around the greasy handle as the man-man roared and came down on me, his hands reaching for my throat. I swung with everything I had left, a desperate, half-blind surge of movement. The hatchet bit into his shoulder, a sickening crunch of bone and flesh. Blood spattered across me as he screamed, a howl of rage and pain. I scrambled backward, my vision blurring as I pulled myself toward the door, my body a screaming mass of agony. Behind me, I could hear the man and scrambling, roaring curses. Stumbling out of the cabin, I fell to my knees. Cold night air filled my lungs as I panted, the pain in my knee almost unbearable. The adrenaline was fading fast, and my body was giving way to exhaustion and terror. But I had to move, to keep going before he, my heart skipped a beat. Headlights cut through the trees, 
casting long shadows across the clearing. The old man's returning? Or, oh God, please let it be someone else, anyone else. The vehicle screeched to a halt. Men in uniforms piled out, their shouts cutting through my muddled thoughts. I must have blacked out for a moment because when I looked again, the madman was being wrestled to the ground, his face a bloody mask. Pain was fading into numbness now, and I sagged forward into blessed darkness. I don't remember much after that, the concerned faces, the sirens, the hospital. But even now, with months of therapy behind me, the lingering sense of unease never fully fades. I'll catch a whiff of something metallic and greasy like the cabin, or find myself staring into the darkness, haunted by the madman's wild eyes. And always, I wonder how many more are still out there, hiding in plain sight somewhere in those vast, wild woods. The drive went from road trip to nightmare somewhere along the desolate highways of Wyoming. This was my first big solo RV trip, a way to cope with the messy end to a long marriage, and honestly, it had been great so far. I'm Arden, by the way. Nice to meet you, considering the circumstances and all. Anyway... I took a tip from a kindly gas station attendant about a scenic spot off the beaten path. Said it was popular with locals, tucked away and serene by a little-known lake. It was beautiful. Aspen trees shimmered gold and the lake was like a giant mirror framed by snow-tipped mountains. I set up camp in a secluded clearing and even managed to catch a decent-sized trout for dinner. By the time the last embers died in my campfire, full darkness had settled. And that's when it hit me just how isolated I was up here. Silly, I know, but the night sounds were magnified, rustling leaves, an owl's eerie hoot, even the tiny splash of a fish in the lake. I'm not usually a jumpy person, but the creeping unease had me triple-checking that my RV doors were locked. I woke with a jolt to a sound I can only describe as wrong. Like dry branches snapping, but close. Too close. My heart pounded in my chest. I peeked out the window, moonlight throwing long, twisted shadows across the forest floor. Nothing. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I tried to ignore it, chalk it up to my own nerves until I saw it, a flicker of movement just at the edge of the tree lean. My breath caught in my throat. It was just a silhouette. A tall, lanky figure, hunched over slightly, but undeniably human. He was staring directly at my RV. Panic kicked in. Who was out here this far out? Why was he watching me? I scrambled for my phone on the nightstand nose signal figures. I had a small handgun for emergencies, but I didn't even know where the damn thing was. I took a shuddering breath, forcing myself to assess the situation. If I stayed in the RV, I was a sitting duck. But out in the open, he'd know exactly where I was. I had to at least try to get away. Easing the RV door open, I made a break for the nearest clump of trees. I heard him behind me, his footsteps strangely muffled on the soft soil, like they were barely there. He was closing in fast. I stumbled, falling against the rough bark of a pine and scraping my knee. Pain shot through me. He was practically on me now, his raspy breathing echoing in the night. A hand reached out in the darkness, long fingers wrapping around my ankle. I kicked out, my scream tearing through the silence. He let out a hiss of pain, his grip loosening. My heart pounding, I scrambled to my feet. I had to get back to the RV, had to find my gun. I ran, blinded by tears and fear, branches whipping at my face. 
Reaching the clearing, I saw the silhouette standing directly in front of my RV. He had beaten me. Desperation fueled me. Then I saw a glint of metal beside the RV door. My fishing pole. I charged towards it, snatching it up and swinging it hard, the sturdy graphite tip connecting with a sickening thunk. He stumbled back, a surprised grunt escaping him. The fight wasn't over, but at least I had something, anything to defend myself with. He circled me warily, his eyes gleaming in the moonlight. They were wild, feral, not quite right. Just who or what was this guy? A twig snapped from behind me. I whipped around, my heart sinking. Another figure emerged from the trees. This one, bulkier, with coarse, matted hair. Had he been sneaking up on me this whole time? They began advancing, closing in from both sides. I was trapped. My mind raced. Did I try talking to them, reasoning with them? Would that even work? Could I take them both? There was a loud bang behind me and a burst of light split the darkness. A third man stepped into the clearing, older, dressed in worn hiking gear, holding a rifle. He shouted something at the two who were closing in on me. They froze, their attention now on him. You two leave the lady alone. His voice boomed, authoritative but with a slight tremor. Ain't right, stalking a person at night. The two men exchanged a glance. It was as though they shared some silent language. The first one, the lanky one, spat something in the dirt. Then they both turned, disappearing back into the woods with eerie silence. The old man lowered his rifle, a sigh escaping him. He approached me cautiously. You all right, ma'am? I couldn't catch my breath. I collapsed to the ground, fishing pole still in hand, my whole body trembling. My would-be rescuer approached cautiously. You all right, ma'am? Through shaky breaths, I managed a feeble. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Name's Wyatt, the man said, extending a weathered hand. Camp out near here, heard some yelling, figured I'd check it out. I accepted his help, standing on wobbly legs. He shone a flashlight around the clearing, then towards the woods. No sight of them now. Bunch of cowards preying on a woman alone. He shook his head in disgust. Who? My voice came out as a hoarse rasp. Who were they? Wyatt frowned. Hard to say. Couple of transients, likely. Drifting types set up camp out in the backwoods and tend to cause trouble. Could be they got the idea to rob you, saw you were alone. Or could be something else. His words sent a shiver down my spine. Something else? Like what? We walked back to my RV. It felt safe, solid after the terror of the woods. Wyatt insisted on staying until dawn, keeping watch outside while I tried to get some rest inside. Every creak, every rustle of leaves sent a surge of adrenaline through me. Sleep was impossible. The next morning, Wyatt helped me pack up my campsite. Best you get back to the main road, ma'am. Town's not too far, should be able to get a cell signal and call the sheriff. He gave me an assessing look. You look plum done in after all that. Give yourself a hot meal and a motel room, rest up proper. I couldn't argue. He was right. I was barely holding it together. I thanked him profusely. But as I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I hadn't seen the last of those men. The way the lanky one looked at me before they left, it wasn't fear. It was more like disappointment, like I'd escaped something, and they were merely biding their time. I followed Wyatt's advice, making it back to town by mid-afternoon. I called the sheriff, my voice shaking as I tried to recount the night's events. He seemed concerned, 
but assured me isolated incidents like this were unfortunately not uncommon. They'd send a patrol around the area, but with no real description of the men and no actual crime committed, not much they could do. I didn't feel any safer. In fact, I felt more exposed now, out in the open like this. I holed up in a cheap motel room, chain-locking the door and barricading it with a chair. Every time a car drove by, my heart pounded. I barely slept. The following day, I couldn't bear staying another night. I got on the road, heading back home, the comforting familiarity of my own city beckoning. But the unease lingered. I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see a battered old truck tailing me. As the days turned into weeks, the incident slowly receded in my mind. Sure, sometimes I'd hear a noise and my heart would race, but life eventually found its normal rhythm again. That is, until a few weeks ago. I was in a grocery store, and I glanced down an aisle, and I swear I saw him. The lanky one. Same wild eyes, same hunched posture. It couldn't be, he was probably miles away, but for a split second, I was frozen in terror. When I looked back, he was gone. I convinced myself it was just someone who looked similar, but I haven't been to that grocery store since. To this day, I don't know who those men were, what they wanted. Drifters? Something more sinister? Maybe I was foolish going off alone like that, but I also refused to let them win, to let them keep me living in fear. All I know is that somewhere out there in the vastness of this country, those men exist, and the idea that our paths might cross again chills me to the bone. I remember back in September, maybe three years ago now. My buddies and I hit up this remote national forest in Colorado. See, Rylance is a big outdoors type, you know, beard down to his belly button, all the flannel. He had this whole trip planned out, a big loop through some of the park's less traveled areas. Us? We're all mostly just in it for the beer and bad jokes after a good long hike. Me, well, I'm Ezra. You'd probably call me a nature. Enthusiast. Like, if there's a pretty view, I'm there. But leave out that whole sleeping on the ground part. Luckily, I've got an RV, so it's like camping on cheat mode, yeah? Way I figure it, the forest doesn't care how you experience it, as long as you pack out your trash. Anyways, this trip was different. I swear, right from the start, the whole place felt off. Not like scary ghost stories. Off. More like an itch you can't scratch. You know those nature documentaries where the music gets all suspenseful when the lion's about to pounce? It was kinda like that vibe. We made camp near this old, dried-up creek bed on our first night. It was supposed to be a quick setup hike out the next day sort of deal. Rylance was already fussing about making good time, but something just didn't sit right with me. There's this saying. Listen to your gut. Well, mine was doing a full tap dance routine. Around dinner time, we all started to hear it. A low rustling, like leaves, but way too loud and concentrated. We'd shine our lights out in the trees, but nothing. Rylance and Jonas start cracking jokes about Bigfoot and werewolves. Honestly, I'd have preferred either one of those at that point. Now, let me describe this place. The trees are kinda thick, but mostly those tall, skinny pines, not much undergrowth. You could see a good distance in there if you really looked. Problem is, the way the shadows fell once it got dark, well, let's just say your mind starts playing some tricks. After the rustling stopped, things got real quiet, that heavy kind of quiet that only happens way out in the boonies. 
and then we heard something else. It was faint at first, like a dry cough coming from deeper in the trees. Ryland stood up, holding his lantern high. Hey there, who's out? Nothing. Not a sound. Probably a deer or something, man, Jonas said, but his voice was a bit tight. We stayed by the fire, getting more and more on edge with every minute. No one wanted to admit it, but the deer theory was sounding mighty thin at this point. Whatever was out there, it was watching us. Even over the crackling of the fire, I could hear it, that raspy breathing, getting closer. Jonas let out a shaky laugh. Well, this is just perfect, isn't it? Lost in the woods, and Bigfoot's about to come for dessert. Then we saw them. Well, not them exactly, just the eyes. Two low to the ground, reflecting the firelight back at us like yellow marbles. And they were moving, circling us just beyond the edge of the light. Ryland swore. Get the rifle, Ezra. I was already halfway to the RV. Thing is, I'm not the hunting type. Gun was mostly there for emergencies, and man, were we knee-deep in an emergency right about now. Got it off the rack, hands shaking like crazy. I stumbled back outside, Rylance and Jonas already standing back to back, scanning the darkness. Where is it? Rylance's voice was strained but steady. I don't wait there. I pointed towards a gap in the trees where I saw those damned eyes flash again. Just for a split second, I saw a shape too. Bigger than a wolf, and lanky, moving too fast to be any natural animal I knew of. I raised the rifle, trying to get a clear shot while my heart hammered against my ribs. Rylance yelled, No! Wait for a sure! The thing was out in the open, and Lord, it was awful. I don't know how to say it any other way. For patchy, skin that looked too tight over two sharp bones. Its head, twisted wrong, like an owl, but with teeth filling an unnaturally wide mouth. The gun barked in my hands, the kick nearly taking me off my feet. It let out a screech, like metal against metal, and disappeared back into the blackness. For a few seconds, all we could hear was our own ragged breathing. Then... More of those coughs and wheezes started up, this time from multiple directions. We gotta move! Now! Rylance barked out. Ezra, get in the RV, start it! Chaos after that. Fumbling with the keys, the engine finally roaring to life, headlights cutting a path through the darkness. Rylance and Jonas jumped in, yelling at me to floor it. I did tearing down a narrow dirt road, branches scraping against the sides of the RV. I looked in the rearview mirror. Those yellow eyes were following, bobbing in and out of sight between the trees. They weren't giving up, not by a long shot. I kept driving, the gas pedal practically through the floor. I don't know how long it took, but eventually we broke out of the dense forest onto the main highway. Those eyes never reappeared, and we didn't stop till we were back in civilization. Now, folks say I must have imagined the whole thing. Bad case of the nerves, being out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe, but those eyes, and that awful, rasping breathing. There's things out there in the dark places, things we ain't meant to see, and once you do, well, they don't easily let you forget. Jonas never went on another camping trip after that. Rylance, he got quieter, spent more time staring off into the distance. Me? I sold the RV a week later. Some nights, I still think I hear that coughing in the wind, and let's just say, I don't sleep much in hotel rooms on the ground floor. <laughs>